Members, Tarawa Nona Tarawa Nanawal, Yangu Nalawari, Duni Manyan, Nalawari Tarawari, Naginda Dindi, Tarawa, Nalawabun, Lin Chimara, Lejinyin. Members, the words I've just spoken are in the language of the traditional custodians and translate to this is Ngunnawal country. Today we are gathering on Ngunnawal country. We pay our respects to elders, female and male, in Ngunnawal country. Members, I ask that we now stand in silence and pray and reflect on our responsibilities to the people of the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you, members. Clark. The following petition has been lodged by Mrs Jones from 201 residents requesting that the Assembly call on the ACT Government to amend the Red Hill Integrated Plan to remove the development on the Federal Golf Course and rejects amendments to the Territory Plan that would enable housing development. The terms of this petition will be recorded in Hansard and a copy referred to the appropriate Minister for Response pursuant to Standing Order 100. Pursuant to Standing Order 98A, I propose the question that the petition so lodged be noted. So the question now is that that motion is agreed. Mrs Jones. Of certain residents of the Australian Capital Territory draws to the attention and requests that the Assembly notes that ACT residents have been fighting housing development proposals on the Federal Golf Course and loss of adjacent green space for over 30 years. The fight led to a petition signed by 3,100 concerned residents in 2017 calling on the ACT government to develop an integrated plan that genuinely protects existing green space in Hughes, Garen and Deakin and protects the federal golf course lease area. In response, a Legislative Assembly resolution required that the plan limits development to proposals that have a reasonable likelihood of majority community support. The Red Hill Integrated Plan released in 2011 failed fails in this petition's view to deliver on the petition or resolution by including a retirement village on the federal golf course, despite the EPSDD's engagement report finding the retirement village failed to yes. receive the required majority community support. The petitioners therefore request the Assembly to amend the Red Hill Integrated Plan to remove the retirement village and also request the Assembly reject amendments to the Territory Plan, enabling this development. Between the Assembly e-petition tabled yesterday and the paper petition tabled today, 1,721 Canberrans have signed the petition. I agreed to sponsor the petition because as a local member I believe very strongly in the voice of the people. I do not propose that government must always do what is popular, however I do believe that the people are the power behind our system and if government is going to disagree with the community they should do so openly and explain their reasons. The government has set in train a process for the approval of this project. It involves, as per above, an amendment to the Territory Plan. It also involves the draft master plan. The resolution which led to the creation of the integrated plan states that only development with a reasonable likelihood of majority community support should be considered. The plan to allow the development includes various other changes, including a section of bushland being handed back to the government to return to the Red Hill Reserve on the western side of the golf course, the Federal Golf Club giving up other rights to develop on their site, um, and the proposed over 55s living would go ahead, including more plantings and enhanced gardens. The EPSDD engagement report reports on seven recommendations. It states that recommendation one to six received majority community support, and that recommendation seven regarding the over 55 development received on page four described as support and on page 11 described as strong support. However, some people who live in the suburb are quite annoyed with this conclusion and rightly so because the data used to form this conclusion was to the best of my knowledge from the 468 submissions received in support um, by EPSDDs of, of EPSDDs preferred option of the current proposal to build on the southern side of the golf club land. However, reasonably for local residents, they are annoyed that 423 of those submissions were from Federal Golf Club members, meaning that just 45 individual submissions of the 468 were in support from non-Golf Club members. 97 submissions were against. 
Therefore, the government should have said that the proposed development sorry, that should not have said that, the, that they had oh, sorry, the government should have said that there was majority support of golf club members, not local residents. Now, on the question of should the development go ahead, I am personally not strongly aligned with either position at this point. However, I do not like the government's tactics of treating the community as though they are stupid. I've said from the beginning that there is a case all over my electorate for over 55's housing. There are many people living in large houses who would love to downsize within their communities and there are very few options for that. In my vast phone canvassing last year, for example, I had this conversation over and over again about people who want to live close to shops but don't want to stay in their large houses. So I can understand why to some the development seems like a good idea. I am strongly in favour of the intelligence of the residents of my electorate. I give them a lot of credit for their capacity to think things through and see things from many sides. But misrepresenting their views will not lead and will not help the community to come to terms with whatever is decided. The petition having over 500 signatures will be off to the planning committee and we look forward to people having a say there as well. No doubt there are people in favour of the development who live in Hughes and Garran many of whom have contacted my office during the period of this petition. I thank all members of the electorate who signed the petition and those who contacted my office. I am in favour of difference. We live in a wonderful city and I look forward to seeing the response from the Minister to this petition. At least the people have been able to have their say. The question is that the motion be agreed. Ms Davidson. Thank you. As an MLA from Murrumbidgee and a resident of Hughes, I have a keen interest in the Red Hill Integrated Plan and proposed development at Federal Golf Club. I note that the Red Hill Regenerators support the recently released Red Hill Integrated Plan as it provides protection for biodiversity and increases the woodland areas in Red Hill Reserve. Conservation Council confirmed via email on Monday that they stand by their comments made to the Canberra Times published on 24 July, and I quote, the Conservation Council is pleased that the integrated plan for Red Hill provides protection for the northern end of the federal golf course against future commercial and or residential development that would have impacted heavily on the ecological values of the nature reserve and woodland. We continue to advocate for the inclusion of 12.5 hectares of high quality woodland to be rezoned into Red Hill Nature Reserve once the plan is finalised. The proposed low impact development of the south end of the site will require ongoing monitoring to ensure that it delivers the best environmental outcome for the area, including appropriate buffers between the development and the woodlands." End quote. The Conservation Council have stated that they would be concerned if development were to be shifted to the northern end of the course, as ecological impacts of development are likely to be significantly higher than at the southern end. I'm a steadfast believer in the principles of grassroots participatory democracy and community engagement in decision making for our local neighbourhoods. This is why I was pleased to see the Garran Residents Association hold a community meeting on Saturday where Federal Golf Club uh, provided a detailed presentation on their proposed development, including maps not previously published and answered questions from local residents. The questions that I heard during the meeting covered a range of concerns, including financial viability of the club, bushfire risks, water use, traffic on Kitchener and Brereton streets and biodiversity. It's my hope that residents and Federal Golf Club will continue to engage in constructive, respectful and honest con con conversation about the future of our neighbourhood. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. We'll move to ministerial statements and I'll call Miss Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity today to provide an update on the Assembly to the Assembly on the Government's progress on implementing the agreed recommendations of the 9th Assembly Standing Committee inquiries into standardised testing and bullying and violence, and also on the great work being done in our schools. The Government welcomed the final reports from both of these inquiries and agreed to 28 recommendations. Since these two inquiries were handed down in 2018 and 2019 respectfully, the Government has been taking action on all of the agreed recommendations. As the Assembly will know, updates on inquiry recommendations are included annually in the Directorate's annual report, and I refer my colleagues to the Education Directorate annual report for more detailed reporting against each of these recommendations. I can update the Assembly that in relation to the standardised testing inquiry, 
the government continues to implement the seven agreed or agreed in principle recommendations and has completed one of the recommendations at the end of last financial year. A number of the committee's final recommendations relate to NAPLAN and the national discussions about the Australian curriculum. NAPLAN testing provides a snapshot of a student's progress at a point in time and is one of many tools used to assess and further their learning. It is a narrow point in time assessment that provides information about only a few subjects among all of the learning that happens in our schools. Results are used in many ways to learn more about a student's learning journey, but the aim of the tool is not to compare school, school, schools and jurisdictions. As part of the NAPLAN process, parents and carers receive two reports. One report compares each child's achievement with students in the same year level across Australia, whilst the second report provides information on each child's responses to the skills tested. This year, student reports will be distributed in September. Parents can use the information as a trigger for a conversation with their child's teacher or principal about their school's approach to learning. ACT teachers, and ACT teachers know their students, and no data set can replace visiting your local school, meeting with school leaders, teachers and support staff, and learning more about school culture. The government continues to participate in the national discussions about the Australian curriculum and review of NAPLAN, including encouraging efforts to ensure reports to schools and parents can be provided as quickly as possible. For some time, the government has had concerns about the Index of Community Socio-Educational Advantage, or ICSIA, used in the similar schools model, creating a bias in interjurisdictional comparisons of NAPLAN performance for the ACT. Last year, education ministers agreed to a project to explore the operation of the Socio-Educational Advantage Index in the ACT to determine if there were any anomalies that may affect comparisons with ACT schools. Early signs are that observed differences, which have been widely reported, may be more a measurement issue rather than a performance issue. The project has not been finalised, and so the results of the analysis have not yet progressed to education ministers. I look forward to updating the Assembly on this in due course. Madam Speaker, in relation to the agreed recommendations of the Bullying and Violence Inquiry, I am pleased to advise the Assembly that by the end of June 2020, this government had already completed half of the 21 agreed and agreed in principle recommendations. We are continuing to implement the remaining recommendations. ACT public schools are engaging places to learn, to, dedicated to learning with more than 50,000 students and nearly 4,000 teachers attending ACT public schools every day. Acts of violence and bullying in our schools are not acceptable and never have been. Since the inquiry, we have continued to work to ensure a safe and inclusive school environment for both students and teachers, and I am pleased to talk further about this now. The government is committed to making sure that schools are places where students love to learn. As members will know, having students at the centre is a foundation of the future of education strategy, as is strong communities for learning. The safe and supportive schools policy requires every ACT public school to explicitly teach social skills and positive behaviours in accordance with the Australian curriculum. This is undertaken as one of the seven essential features of the Positive Behaviour for Learning framework. Positive Behaviour for Learning is a framework that schools use to get everyone – students, staff, families and the school community – on the same page to create a safe and supportive learning environment for all students. The majority of ACT public schools have started implementing positive behaviour for learning and continued government investment will support the rollout to all remaining public schools. All ACT public schools have access to a school psychologist. In 2016, this government committed to an additional 20 school psychologists by 2020 We've delivered on this commitment, and as of June 2021, schools are supported by more than 80 full-time equivalent psychologists. ACT public schools also have access to a multidisciplinary model of support, including allied health professionals, to complement the work of psychologists and enhance the supports for schools and students. This government has also committed to hiring an additional 25 youth and social workers in this term of government building on the investment of the previous term. 
I can advise the Assembly that as part of the public mental health system after hours support is available through the Access Mental Health for children and young people. This service is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Information sharing and linkages between child and adolescent mental health services and school youth health nurses are also being strengthened. Regarding incident reporting through enhanced IT functionality, principals are now able to ensure greater consistency in, in centralised recording of both positive and negative student incidences. Students and parents are encouraged to raise inc incidences of bullying and violence within their school. However, there are processes in place that give students and parents the opportunity to raise complaints or concerns regardless of their nature with the Education Directorate. This is through an online feedback and complaints form or through contact with the feedback and complaints phone line. Currently being piloted on the parent portal will also be a link to information on how to provide feedback and complaints. For students, a link to information on how to provide feedback and complaints will be published on the digital backpack in Term 3 for easy access. A strong sense of identity or belonging between a student and their school is important. Students who identify with their school are more likely to engage in learning and to behave in line with school norms and values. Similarly, positive staff identification and parent carer identification with the school has a beneficial impact on wellbeing and school culture. I'm pleased to advise that the results of the 2020 school identification measure showed significant increases and exceeded targets in all three measures. 66% of students had a strong identification with their school in 2020, up from the 60% in 2019. For staff, 92% in 2020, up from 89% in 2019. And for parents and carers, 82% up from 73% in 2019. As I've said many times before in this assembly, I'm proud of the free public education provided in each of our 89 schools every day as well as the strong cross-sectorial partnerships that have been forged across the education system. And once again, I will take the opportunity <clears throat> to acknowledge and thank our teachers for their hard work yesterday, today and tomorrow. Thank you. I um, ask that the Assembly take notice of the statement and I present a paper. Copy of the paper. question is that that motion be agreed. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank Minister Berry for her response to the motion passed by the Assembly at our last sitting. All Canberran students should have access to a world-class education system. I'd like to take the opportunity to wholeheartedly agree with the sentiments the Minister ended her statement with. I too am a proud product of Canberra's public school system. The ACT Greens will always put public schools first to ensure equity in access and education. There are a number of key challenges for our education system that the government is actively grappling with. We have ageing infrastructure and a booming population. We're held to ransom by the Commonwealth who force our students to undertake a standardised testing system that we know cannot capture the richness and diversity of education that our students get in our schools. We know that like all other jurisdictions around the country, our schools are struggling to recruit and retain teachers due to unacceptably large workloads and the relatively low pay for the high level of responsibility they hold every day. And we know that young people's mental health needs can be very demanding and that schools play a central role in ensuring that each student and their families can be supported to ensure their safety and improve their wellbeing. I'm pleased to hear an update on these issues, and I'm particularly happy to hear that the Minister has been engaging in conversations with her counterparts about NAPLAN and what can be done to better analyse this data. My amendments to Mr Hanson's motion in June came about after discussions with the ACT Parents uh, PNC Association and the Australian Education Union, who expressed to me their desire to see the government prioritise implementing the well thought through and evidenced recommendations from previous inquiries and the government's own future of education strategy. It should be note noted that the intention of my amendments to Mr Hanson's motion was to receive a more detailed examination from the Minister of the Directorate's progress on the recommendations and the status of the future of education strategy. I am slightly disappointed to have been directed to the annual reports from last year, noting that a full year has passed where no doubt significant work has been done in our schools, and this, was the sta this statement was the opportunity to present the Assembly with that timely update. The Government has a bold vision for our education system, which is why the Government has committed to a number of actions in the parliamentary and governing agreement, 
including rolling out three-year-old preschool for all, investing in new schools and infrastructure, and ensuring our classrooms and learning spaces are climate adaptable. I look forward to continuing to work from the crossbench to ensure that these commitments are implemented in an effective and timely manner. I'm proud to be a member of a party and a government that supports all students, inclusive of their backgrounds and experience, to access a world-class education through our public schools. Question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Staying with ministerial statements, and I'll call Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, in response to recommendation 12 of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety uh, released report 1, the annual financial reports 2019 to 2020, appropriation bill 2020 2021, and appropriation office of the Legislative Assembly bill 2020 2021, the government agreed to provide a ministerial statement outlining the actions taken in relation to coordination and training activities with New South Wales and Commonwealth agencies, including the Australian Defence Force. And I'd like to thank the Standing Committee for its report, as I provide members with the following information. The ACT Emergency Services Agency, or ESA, has always maintained strong cross-border relationships with all of their operational counterparts, as well as the services available nationally through the Australian Fire and Emergency Services Authority Council, or AFAC, and has a long working relationship across government at a variety of levels to enhance emergency coordination across the ACT, New South Wales border, and between the ACT and Australian governments. To formalise arrangements with external organisations and agencies, the ESA has several memorandums of understanding, or MOUs, and mutual aid agreements, or MAAs, which are reviewed regularly to strengthen the working relationship with cross-border and national counterparts. Whilst an MOU is an overarching agreement and provides general guidance to service in regard to operations, coordination, liaison and communications, MAAs outline the operational response to fires and highlight how operations will be conducted when both jurisdictions are involved. Moreover, MAAs cover the working arrangements when a fire has the potential to cross jurisdictional boundaries. The ACT Rural Fire Service, or ACTRFS, maintains a good, productive working relationship with their cross-border colleagues. This is formally facilitated through an MOU with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, as well as a complementary local MAA. Similarly, ACTRFS has an MOU with New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, which outlines the operational working arrangements between our two agencies. The MOU also promotes cooperation between the agencies involved in fire detection and suppression. ACT State Emergency Service, or ACTSES, has an MOU with New South Wales State Emergency Service, which outlines an operational response to storm and flood events, and specifically when assistance may be required from New South Wales SES, Southern Eastern Zone. However, currently the ACT SES is working with New South Wales SES on the development of a cross-border operations procedural guide which will cover the working arrangements in more detail. Each year, members across ESA and from within its operational services take part in joint training with their cross-border counterparts to enhance operational skills, practice the use of specialised equipment and share knowledge. ACT Fire and Rescue have close, worked closely with New South Wales Fire and Rescue to participate in various training uh, including structural firefighting and operational driver training. By sending members of ACT Fire and Rescue to New South Wales, our frontline firefighters are able to continue learning new skills and share the lessons with local firefighters through local training opportunities. New South Wales RFS has participated and assisted ACT RFS with remote area firefighting team training and their ongoing capability building. ACT RFS are continuing to work alongside New South Wales to conduct hazard reduction burns in the surrounding New South Wales region, which is an integral part of bushfire preparedness and training for members in both services. ACT SES participate in cross-border training with the local New South Wales SES units 
and the New South Wales SES Southern Eastern Zone to upskill local ACT SES members in capabilities not regularly utilised in the ACT, specifically around flood boat operations and vertical rescue. While the skills obtained may not be traditionally used within the ACT, it allows ACT SES to have an appropriately skilled membership to support New South Wales SES operationally when required. By participating in training and maintaining strong working relationships with their cross-border counterparts, the ESA are better equipped locally and have the support of New South Wales agencies should it be needed. The ESA works in a collaboration with New South Wales um, Park Service, the ACT Parks and Conservation Service and the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries to deliver multi-hazard level two incident management training courses that cover the four main streams of the Australian Inter-Service Incident Management System, or AIMS, structure. These courses are run locally and are offered to members of all four operational services within ESA, as well as enabling staff to ensure a consistent approach to incident management in both ACT and New South Wales. In the past few years, ESA members have also had the opportunity to attend the Level 2 AIMS training at New South Wales RFS Training Academy in Dubbo, New South Wales, which has enabled the ESA volunteers and staff to train alongside members of New South Wales RFS to share experiences. Training with and learning from members of New South Wales RFS strengthens the ESA's capability to manage local incidents as well as provide valuable support interstate when required. The ESA also regularly deploys public information officers to assist New South Wales during times of emergency. During the Black Summer fires, ESA deployed four public information officers to six different locations across New South Wales. More recently, ESA deployed five public information officers to two locations within New South Wales to assist with the flood response. In the past 24 months, the ESA has worked with New South Wales RFS to certify three Level 3 Public Information Officers under the New South Wales RFS Public Information Officer Training Program. And since March 2020, the ESA has facilitated awareness workshops for Australian Defence Force, or ADF, planning and liaison personnel in AIMS to ensure they, uh, that any ADF personnel who may work collaboratively with ESA incident management teams are aware of the systems, processes and terminology used by emergency management personnel. Further to various uh, training opportunities, both formally and informally, the ESA is also involved in joint scenario exercises and planning activities each year that assist with planning and preparation for incidents. ACT Fire and Rescue, in conjunction with uh, New South Wales RFS, Kawula Brigade, identified an opportunity to exercise and practice the capabilities of their compressed air foam system, or CAFS, appliances in an ongoing ca uh, capacity through participating in hazard reduction burns in the Kawula area each year. Whilst this is considered a valuable cross-border training opportunity, it also provides members with the ability to exercise the capabilities of their communication systems in a controlled scenario should they be required in an operational incident. The ESA has recently undertaken to reinvigorate the cross-border working group for emergency management to enhance cross-border preparedness and liaison for emergency incidents that occur close to the cross uh, or across the border between the two jurisdictions. The work program for this group is being developed to build scenario planning activities into an all hazards preparedness program and is jointly led by New South Wales Police and ESA. As recommended in the McLeod inquiry into operational response to the January 2003 bushfires, the ACT RFS regularly attend Bushfire Management Committee or BFMC meetings as cross-border liaisons. Held four times a year, the BFMC's objective is to ensure closer collaboration between ACT RFS and the surrounding New South Wales zones in relation to training, operational response, communication systems, hazard reduction strategies and seasonal conditions. 
These meetings are also attended by the relevant land managers, government authorities and response agencies with a planning and strategic interest in the relevant zones. Since 2001, ACT SES have participated in the National Disaster Rescue Challenge, or NDRC, which is an opportunity for state and territory emergency service volunteers from across Australia to display their skills in the spirit of friendly competition. The NDRC is an integral part of training and development for ACT SES volunteers and provides, uh, provides opportunities to build stronger working relationships with their cross-border counterparts. Following the events of the Aural Valley fire, the ESA has undertaken a, a secondment arrangement by embedding New South Wales RFS public information officers into the ESA public information team for 12 months. This arrangement has facilitated cross-border knowledge sharing and assisted in enhancing public information and warnings coordination between the agencies. In October 2020, the ESA invited New South Wales RFS to mentor the ESA public information team during a two-day incident management exercise. This exercise was valuable in better aligning processes and knowledge sharing. The ESA is also participating in a number of national projects to enhance and further standardise the delivery of emergency warnings and information right across Australia. The ESA aims to deliver the Fires Near Me ACT mobile application integrated and cohesive with the Fires Near Me New South Wales app by November 2021. This will enhance cross-border information access for New South Wales and ACT residents. In the ACT, arrangements have long been in place for the ADF to be accommodated as part of our Emergency Coordination Centre. The ESA regularly meets with the appropriate representatives of ADF through the Joint Operational Support Service and more recently the Joint Task Group responsible for the coordination of support and planning of operational support respectively. This liaison includes ADF standing membership on the ESA Joint Operations Coordination Group, or the JOS uh, G, which brings together all of ACT government and associated partners who may work together during their preparedness or response to a major emergency in the ACT. As a result of the long-standing relationship, the ADF personnel deployed to the ACT were able to have an almost immediate impact in assisting our community during the 2019-20 bushfires. Some of the tasks the ADF assisted in included, but was not limited to, fire ground surveillance, door knocking, personal transport, bus and helicopter, provision of accommodation for interstate crews, including catering at ADFA, provision of heavy plant and other equipment with uh, training operators, incident management team, emergency coordination centre and planning support, hand crews for development of helipads and indirect fire attack. The excellent work of all services, including the ADF, minimised the impact of these fires and ensured there was no loss of life as a result of the bushfires that surrounded the ACT. The ACT government, and in particular ESA, has undertaken an extensive lessons learned program with the ADF. These lessons identified what uh, happened nationally in the 2019-20 bushfire season, including the working relationship with the ADF and the extensive use of aerial assets nationally. The ESA will continue to maintain and develop their relationship with the ADF so that they can understand each other's requirements, allowing better utilisation of ADF into the future. In this regard, the ESA has exchanged correspondence with the Deputy Chief of Army to facilitate further joint training programs, including incident management training and exercise training. The ongoing relationship with the ADF also extends to AFAC, and significant work has been undertaken by AFAC and ADF to engage across jurisdictions nationally, including exchange of information and training programs. Madam Speaker, in the 2019-20 bushfire season, we saw unprecedented fire activity that heavily impacted large areas along the east coast of Australia. New South Wales fires near the ACT and fires within the ACT 
were the toughest our region has had to contend with since 2003. A timely coordination and response from all areas across the ACT government, with assistance from other jurisdictions, resulted in no loss of life or residence due to the fires. A number of reviews and inquiries have been conducted in relation to the 2019-20 season, all with the aim of making improvements for future seasons. Given the history of damaging bushfires and severe storms in the ACT, and recent changes in climate that have further contributed to the threat of flooding and grass fire in the region, the ESA is well aware of the importance of ensuring that they are taking the best possible approach to preparing for bushfire and storm threats. This includes training and coordination activities conducted with New South Wales and Commonwealth agencies. In closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to once again commend all emergency service volunteers and staff across government for their continued protection of our community. Canberra remains one of the safest cities in the world because of their hard work. The question is that the motion be agreed. You have the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. So now the question is that that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Call Mr Steele. I'm pleased to be able to provide an update to the Assembly on the new CIT campus Woden, along with the new public transport interchange and associated infrastructure works. It's exciting to see the integrated CIT Woden campus and Woden interchange project kicking up a gear with significant work getting underway on construction of the first package and further consultation as design progresses on the other packages of work. The project comprises four packages in total. The first package delivers new bus layovers and supporting road and intersection upgrades, with the second package of work providing an improved and expanded transport interchange on Callum Street, future-proof to welcome light rail. Package three will deliver the new CIT campus itself, with 22,500 square metres of educational community facilities hosting smart classrooms, state-of-the-art simulated learning environments, commercial kitchens and hands-on training spaces. And the fourth package of works will deliver a new culturally appropriate facilities for Yurana, CIT's dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Educational Centre of Excellence, and this will be delivered on CIT's Bruce campus contributing to the renewal of that campus in the process. Madam Speaker, stepping back for a moment, the coming years are going to be critical for the ACT's vocational education and training sector, of which CIT is an integral part. The combination of the negotiation of a national skills agreement, the impact of COVID-19 on our workforce and the related skills shortages have put a spotlight on the sector. As a government, our priorities are to ensure that the ACT VET system is responsive to the needs of industry and learners and provides quality training outcomes no matter where people or what people choose to study. These objectives have long been features of FED in the ACT, but there is an urgency now to strengthen our system to meet the challenges ahead. We know that many businesses in the ACT are experiencing difficulties attracting skilled staff, particularly in construction, digital, health and community sectors. There are many reasons why these skill shortages exist, but the training system must be at the forefront in ensuring Canberrans have the skills needed to drive the prosperity of our economy and deliver high quality services to our community. We have lots of work underway to tackle this, including preparing to roll out a second round of the very successful Job Trainer Initiative, working through the new Skills Industry Advisory Group to identify where the most critical skills gaps are and come up with tailored plans to close them supporting CIT to strengthen, adapt and update its offerings to ensure that these are well aligned with industry needs. The new National Skills Agreement with the Commonwealth will have a substantial impact on our ability to invest in and grow that in Canberra. So we will also continue to argue for the best possible deal from our colleagues on the Hill. As we move into the post-COVID-19 recovery <laughs> period, Canberra's skills sector will be essential to ensure that we have a strong and highly skilled workforce to keep growing and diversifying our economy. This is the context that, context that the new CIT campus Woden sits within. It will deliver a new home for the Institute and make a major contribution to the revitalisation of Woden. But just as importantly, it's an investment in strengthening our local skills sector 
and, and ensuring that we're bringing the best offerings to bear for vet students in the years supporting our broader economy. The Woden campus will ensure that CIT remains a provider of choice and an agile partner to meet industry, business and community needs by delivering quality vocational education and training for the jobs of the future. The campus is a smart campus platform and its integration with the CIT cloud campus will support these objectives and the new campus will complement CIT's existing training facilities and networks at Fishwick, Bruce, Gungahlin and Tuggeranong and help to drive the transition to new ways of delivering its courses through cloud-based and digital learning. Madam Speaker, our vision for CIT Woden is, is a world-leading educational campus facilitated through digitally enabled learning and innovation spaces. It will provide the future skills and training opportunities required to meet the growing demands of industry and the ACT community. This new unique development alongside an enhanced transportation hub will activate the Woden Town Centre precinct, enabling the transformation of CIT to further support the ACT's reputation as the knowledge capital of Australia. The new flagship campus, CIT Woden, will be home to around 6,500 students and is planned to open for classes in 2025. Students who attend the CIT campus in Woden will enjoy dynamic educational experience, from digitally enabled learning spaces to collaboration opportunities with local industry and more. Madam Speaker, we are ambitious about what this project can do for CIT, for the Woden Town Centre and for the broader community. I've been very clear to the architects from the beginning and during the development of the reference design and to the potential future delivery partners that this project is seeking to showcase the very best in sustainable building and design for a major public facility. The ACT government is seeking architectural excellence and showcasing sustainable design in the delivery of a new campus, an exemplar for building and sustainable urban design in a public facility. In particular, we are keen to see an extensive rooftop garden showcased with good solar access to maximise the benefits to campus users, while also achieving the ACT government's other sustainability aspirations. The Woden Town Centre has a reputation for being a bit of a concrete jungle with cold and hard lines and this requires a thoughtful architectural response. We are keen to avoid the replication of challenges arising from previous generations of development in the area. With the CIT building there's an opportunity to strong, strongly differentiate the campus from nearby buildings both built and planned. The new CIT campus provides an opportunity to usher in the new chapter of Woden's story bringing a different look and feel through innovation in its design, introducing warm and soft building elements in the design as a response to the challenging environment. Adding new services and amenities and creating inviting new spaces throughout the campus that people will want to spend time in will be a key feature of the design because the government has also made it clear that our desire is to create a people-friendly space that enhances Woden Town Centre as a safe, attractive and interesting place to live, work, learn and visit. For example, the government has a strong desire to deliver an east-west boulevard as a space that can be used comfortably to dwell throughout Canberra's seasons. As a place where students, staff and members of the community alike genuinely enjoy spending time because it offers a sense of connection, welcome and a sense of liveliness. Another key focus of the campus is that it is well integrated with its environment, the new public transport interchange and the broader town centre. This integration is at the heart of the design principles for CIT Woden and the Woden Interchange project. Whilst this project is being delivered across three packages in Woden, all of the packages are being designed to deliver a single vision for the Woden Town Centre that is integrated and works together across transport, connectivity, landscaping, sustainability and public amenities. Madam Speaker, the next 12 months will be the busiest yet for the Woden CIT project. During this time, the procurement of a delivery partner for the campus itself will be finalised and detailed design will get underway. Madam Speaker, <laughs> consultation continues to inform the project to deliver a new CIT campus and Woden transport and interchange for Woden. As part of package three, the new CIT campus, a reference design has been developed to guide tenderers for the design and construction contract. Hundreds of hours of consultation have taken place up until this point with CIT staff, students and key stakeholders, members of our Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, including Ngunnawal elders and the wider community. 
From these and many other meetings, our designers have gathered information relating to people's aspirations for the campus, their community, their learning and professional needs, and the ways in which they will use its spaces, all of which is informing the design and layout of the campus. Subject-specific details, for example, such as private meeting spaces, breakout rooms, maker spaces, teaching and learning spaces, storage spaces, have all come from workshops and input from the people who will occupy the new campus. This feedback will continue to inform the development of the designs. The reference design will challenge bidders to design and construct the project to deliver a transformational and architecturally outstanding building, while also leaving scope for innovation, creativity and bold sustainability goals. A lot of thought has gone into the reference design in relation to how the floor plates and use of space throughout the building can foster collaboration and innovation and support new modes of learning that meet meet the needs of today's VET students. We want to make sure that we maintain a focus on how real people will use all of the campus's public and private spaces as we continue through the design process. The reference design includes landscaped, activated pedestrians, uh, ped landscaped and activated pedestrian spine that will run through the centre of the campus, connecting the new Woden Transport Interchange in the east to the town centre in the west. The public realm will deliver vibrant, green and relaxing spaces for the whole community to use. We are ensuring that the reference design also considers the integration of accessible services, amenities and spaces on the lower floors of the CIT building to create a welcoming and vibrant environment for the community and industry to interact with the campus. This area will be designed and landscaped to create areas with a uni unique identity, providing outdoor teaching and learning spaces for CIT, while also containing key landscaping themes that ensure cohesion to Woden Town Square and Aravenue Park. Further design and consultation on the campus part of the project will take place over the next 12 months. The next stage in an ongoing series of opportunities for Woden residents, the broader Canberra community to have their say in the design of the campus building and surrounding spaces. This will inform the final brief that is provided to the successful design and construction tenderer early next year following the finalisation of the procurement for this contract. To facilitate some of this consultation, I am pleased to announce that Major Projects Canberra are setting up a community connectivity space in Woden Town Square, which will allow for the community to engage and keep up to date on all the major projects happening in and around Woden, including the new CIT campus, the new interchange, the renewal of Canberra Hospital and light rail. Madam Speaker, Another major part of the regeneration of Woden Town Centre is the redevelopment of the Woden Interchange. Woden Public Transport Interchange badly needs an upgrade. The current one is now over 50 years old, lacks capacity for the future growth of the bus network and relies on a temporary dirt layover on the former police station site. Many public transport users have told us that they feel unsafe because of its design and location. We want the town centre to be as accessible as possible for pedestrians, active travel and public transport. And we want an interchange that provides great integration with future light, the future light rail terminus. The Woden Town Centre Master Plan set the vision for an on-street interchange that upgrades the bus interchange to include the demolition of the existing bus interchange and building a new on-street bus station. The upgrades are proposed to, to the verges along Callum, Bowes, Matilda and Launceston streets, the master plan said. The upgrades allow for the new retail development opportunities facing onto the new bus station and locating rapid transport stops onto Callum Street. Madam Speaker, the government is delivering on the intentions of the Woden Town Centre master plan in building an on-street Woden interchange with construction due to commence towards the end of this year. The new integrated public transport interchange on Callum Street will provide improved wayfinding, accessibility, modern safety features, improved solar access and better lines of sight than is currently possible. It will include 10,000 square metres of passenger friendly space and an expanded number of stops at 18 up from the current 11. The new interchange will be future proof to accommodate stage two of light rail from Gungahlin to Woden with the light rail stops being built and used as rapid bus stops until construction on the line from the city to Woden is complete. Stops for buses and light rail will carry through a similar design, 
the light rail stops in stage one, which provide good shelter from the elements and which were subject to considerable community consultation. The Woden Town Centre Master Plan also recommended that Launceston and Callum Streets be low speed vehicle environments that provide for public transport and private vehicles accessing the town centre. I am pleased to say that construction has already begun on package one, which involves the construction of a small bus layover on Eastie Street and a new Launceston Street bus layover. These layovers are being supported by new traffic signals on surrounding roads to ensure the efficient flow of buses and private traffic in and out of Woden, delivering a lower speed and active travel friendly environment. As part of the development of an on-street interchange on Callum Street, Callum Street will be closed from mid-August to provide uh, to private vehicles between Bradley Street and Matilda Street. However, the current bus interchange will remain fully operational until the new interchange is open next year. As anticipated in the master plan, traffic will be managed through Hindmarsh Drive and Melrose Drive. Updated traffic modelling confirms that the arterial roads are currently operating under capacity and can, can divert approximately 600 to 900 cars that use Callum Street each day around the edges of the centre and as a result adequately perform their role and function within the broader road network. This will mean a different way of moving around the town centre, clearly prioritising public transport on Callum Street and active travel as we build a vibrant, better connected and more sustainable town centre. However, when undertaking pre-DA consultation on the public transport interchange late last year, we also heard from the community that they were still concerned about accessibility between the campus and the interchange, as well as the impact on local traffic needing to traverse through the Woden Town Centre after Callum Street is closed. I am pleased to say that access will be maintained to the Town Centre for destination and local traffic, as well as people using public transport and active travel. In response to the community, as part of delivering the campus within Package 3, we will create a new local access shared zone connection between Bowes and Bradley Streets. The new local access shared zone will include traffic calming devices, keeping vehicle speeds at 10 kilometres an hour while providing safe and direct access for drop off and pick up. Major Projects Canberra staff are out in the community right now speaking with residents, commuters and workers about how they might use the shared zone and what inclusions that they'd like to see in its design. This is an example of how community engagement and consultation has also informed the design of the public transport interchange. Community consultation has helped bring forward our commitment to active travel by increasing bike and ride facilities and bike storage. This supports the government's commitment to see our active travel network and public transport system working together to move people around more sustainably through genuine integration of our public transport system with other modes of transport. The CIT campus will also have publicly accessible ground floor that will improve access through to Westfield supported by better wayfinding and signage. This was something else that we knew was important to the community as well as adequate shelter from the elements in the interchange. As work progresses on the design of the CIT campus, further consideration will be given as, as to how the CIT design can complement the bus stops in the interchange and provide for sheltered waiting areas. We have heard that users want clean and usable public toilets accessible from the interchange. I can announce that we will be including public toilets accessible from the interchange as part of the construction of the new CIT campus. Ongoing consideration is needed on the landscaping for all parts of the project. The government will be taking the opportunity to increase canopy coverage across the whole footprint of the integrated project and we will ensure that landscaping treatments are sustainable in the microclimate. This is just one of one of the examples of how the four packages of work should not be seen as siloed developments. We will maintain a focus on integration throughout the delivery of these projects to ensure that the needs of the community, public transport users, CIT staff and students are met across the entire project and packages of work. Madam Speaker, another important element of the broader project is the development of a youth foyer. Creating a safe space for young people to live, completing education, including through the CIT. It will provide housing for up to 20 young people between the ages of 16 to 24 who are at risk. The design's aim is to build a welcoming, comfortable, secure place for residents that they can be proud to call home. 
Linking youth foyer to educational institutions is considered best practice in wraparound service delivery and I'm pleased that by locating the youth foyer directly in an educational institution like the CIT, this will further showcase this world leading integrated model. The final component of the project is the delivery of a new culturally appropriate building for Urana, CIT's dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Centre of Excellence. Community leaders and educators have determined that the Bruce CIT campus provides the most suitable location for Urana in a natural bush setting. This will allow a new culturally appropriate standalone facility to be developed for the centre so that it can continue to expand the most important support services it provides to CIT students from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background and support the renewal of the CIT Bruce campus. In conclusion, I'm looking forward to continuing to update the Assembly in the future progress of this project in delivering a world-class vocational education and training throughout the ACT, including through the CIT Woden Campus project, integrated with an interchange that provides better public transport connectivity and which together are anchoring the regeneration of Woden Town Centre. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. Now the question is that the motion be agreed. Dr Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Um, and thank you, Minister Steele. I share the Minister's excitement about the range of infrastructure improvements occurring across the Woden Town Centre. It's a time of significant change. With change often comes uncertainty and a period of disruption, as well as great opportunity. I commend the Minister and the ACT Government on the extensive community consultation that has been undertaken to initially inform these important changes and to make sure they reflect the needs and desires of the community and also the communications that have been delivered to keep the community updated on what's happening. With so much underway, it's great to see it all brought together under one central portal on the Woden Renewable website. For anyone who's not yet visited that site or hasn't done so recently, I encourage you to check it out. It provides an excellent overview as well as information about consultation opportunities. And it's a great example of using digital technology to good effect, with interactive features which clearly map the various projects underway, provides an intuitive reference point and easy to understand information. The new CIT campus and transport interchange are the current priorities and areas of focus together with, uh, of course, works being undertaken for the hospital expansion. The new purpose-built CIT campus at Woden will help transform and rejuvenate, rejuvenate the area, with a sense of vibrancy to be achieved through the steady and constant stream of foot traffic and pedestrian and other movement in the area. Woden is an excellent choice for the location of this important education facility and will attract a broad demographic and diversity to the area. The sustainable design of the CIT Woden campus reflects the ACT government policies and provides a positive contribution toward modernising our city, utilising best practice design solutions. I'm really pleased to see that the final design for the campus will see a number of small buildings spread over a larger footprint rather than one very tall building. I believe this will contribute to a sense of vibrancy in the area and will provide better placemaking outcomes. The 650 jobs created by this project are also very welcome, especially to the ACT, um, together with all states and territories that continue to suffer the effects of the pandemic. I also welcome the new transport interchange, which will make it much easier, more convenient and more inviting for Canberrans to travel to and from the CIT campus, as well as other key Woden destinations. The interchange will provide links with existing uh, cycling routes and bike parking facilities, allowing people to seamlessly travel between bus services and active travel, providing easy connections and integration between home, work and play. The existing bus interchange was built in the mid-1970s and is showing effects of its age. The enhancements underway will increase its appeal and should attract more people to make better use of our public transport network. Public consultation on various aspects of the CIT campus and transport interchange at Woden remains open until Friday the 20th of August. I encourage all Canberrans to have their say. While the projects are located southside and in my electorate of Murrumbidgee, 
They will be used and accessed by all Canberrans as staff, students and visitors to this world-class facilities being constructed and to the area more broadly. I look forward to the re revitalisation of the Woden Town Centre and the improved pu public realm which will be achieved through the pedestrian boulevard and the new Bowes and Bradley Street connections. These are important thoroughfares and it's critical that our community feels safe moving through these areas at all times of day and night, especially given the interchange, interchange's role in transporting people to and from the Canberra Hospital and CIT. The community feedback that has already been received has highlighted the need for improved safety and connectivity in the area, including clear lines of sight, improved wayfinding signage, lighting and appropriate shelters. I want to help Canberrans, those living in my electorate and those visiting the area, to be able to preference public transport as a primary mode of travel. If we provide the right infrastructure, the right services, the right connections and the right amenities, I believe we will choose to use public transport more. It's important not just that our transport system supports this approach, but also that associate amenities and facilities also support this. There are many benefits to using public transport, and I look forward to a time when all Canberrans embrace this and active travel op options to much greater effect. This will transform our lives, our city, our interactions with each other, and our health and wellbeing. Among the benefits of greater use of public transport are, of course, reduced emissions as we move away from private vehicles, often with only a single passenger, and also community benefits, more vibrant town centres and neighbourhoods as people move within the areas, and the physical and mental health benefits brought about by walking, cycling, scooting, as well as interacting with others in public spaces, our neighbourhoods, town centres and on public transport. By its very nature, public transport includes physical movement elements through the first mile and last mile benefits of needing to walk. It's important that these first mile, last mile connections are easy, safe and efficient. The public realm must be designed in this manner with placemaking principles in mind. I know that Minister Steele and the hardworking staff at the relevant directorates of the ACT government will carefully consider the comments made by the community paired with their professional expertise to deliver some great outcomes for the development of CIT Woden and the transport inter interchange. In closing, I welcome the update provided by Minister Steele and I look forward to continuing to work with the ACT government and members of the community to achieve the best possible outcomes for this area. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Patterson. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Davidson. Thank you. The development of Woden's new CIT is an exciting opportunity to bring new energy into the Woden Town Centre. It will provide employment and education opportunities. It will result in public spaces that feel safer and more inclusive for everyone by increasing activity and visibility in the area after dark. As an MLA for Murrumbidgee, I'm very happy to see plans progressing and consultation with community continuing. There's one very important element I would love to see in our new Woden CIT, a live music venue. The very successful recent Amp It Up program to support live music across our city highlighted the fact that we have a real gap in venues in Woden and Western Creek. It hasn't always been this way, and while I don't miss the Henry Grattan, the closure of Beyond Q in 2020 was a real loss to the community. Losing a live music venue is more than just a loss of employment for the venue staff and one less place for local artists to get a gig. It's also the loss of a place where we can gather to tell the stories that help us make sense of a rapidly changing world. Now more than ever, our communities need the arts. With light rail coming to Woden in the next few years, it will be easier than ever to come from Tuggeranong or Gungahlin to Canberra's geographic heart. And as anyone who has spent more time than they should have in ANU Bar or the UC Refectory can tell you, student life is enriched through access to the arts, even if that means loud music with questionable lyrics. While we have a theatre for hire at Canberra College, a bar and live music venue close to Woden's existing nighttime economy and the public transport hub will be more accessible and attractive. It will bring more activity into the town centre after dark and make it safer for everyone. So, Minister Steele, if you're still feeling unsure about the value to the community and to individual wellbeing that the inclusion of a live music venue would bring to Woden CIT, please consider the range of activities that might take place there. In addition to band performance, we might see comedy, cultural performance, dance, panel discussions, poetry slams and karaoke. 
I hope that you will consider including a live music venue such as a student bar in the CIT as an employment opportunity for hospitality students, a performance space for local artists and to increase activity and boost the nighttime economy in Woden. Thank you, Minister Davidson. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. I, I guess. Thank you. Anyone, just anyone will be fine. Uh, I call Ms Chain. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I'd uh, like to take the opportunity this morning to recognise Mandy Martin, a highly regarded artist, a generous teacher, and a passionate environmentalist. Mandy Martin was born in 1952 in South Australia. Her mother, an accomplished watercolourist, and her father, a professor of botany. Mandy's work boldly and cleverly engaged with social and political commentary from the outset. In 1975, the same year that she graduated from the South Australian School of Art, she created feminist anti-Vietnam War posters. Some of these posters were then acquired for the Australian War Memorial Collection, launching her art career in spectacular fashion. Since becoming a member of the progressive art movement in South Australia in the mid-1970s, social justice and the environment informed her practice for her entire career. Sadly, on 10 July, after a long battle with cancer, Mandy passed away. Mandy's early works were primarily on paper, including screen printed posters. This choice of medium was key to the works being mass produced and thereby having more power to promote change. Her early posters critiqued US imperialism, corruption in big business, and the subsequent exploitation of workers. Her work also advocated for women's fight for equality. Mandy moved to Canberra in 1978, where she married Robert Boynes, also an artist. Together they had two children, Laura and Alexander, who were both accomplished artists in their own right. Her first of over 100 solo exhibitions was at the Solander Gallery in Canberra in 1980. By this time, Mandy had begun making thick impasto brushwork paintings about the impact that humans have on regional, remote and industrial landscapes, both positive and negative. Remarkably, the expert way in which she conveyed her message in her work never overwhelmed its aesthetic value. A work Mandy is particularly well known for and familiar to many of us is the monumental triptych painting, Red Ochre Cove, commissioned in 1987 for Australian Parliament House, which hangs in the main committee room of the Senate. This 12 by three metre major work was made in response to Tom Roberts' painting of the opening of Federal Parliament in Melbourne in 1901, which was then hung in the High Court. Red Ochre Cove had an influential effect on Mandy's career and continues to impact and influence people who have experienced its beauty and its power. I've personally spent a considerable amount of time in the main committee room through many years of Senate estimates in the Commonwealth, and it has left a permanent impression on me. Notably, Mandy's work is held in most of the major state and regional galleries in Australia, including the National Gallery of Australia, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the National Gallery of Victoria, the National Gallery of Western Australia, the National Portrait Gallery, Australian Parliament House, and the Australian War Memorial. Her work has also been collected internationally by the Guggenheim Museum, New York, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno. Mandy was not only a high profile artist, nationally and internationally, but she also had a talent for bringing together thinkers from a range of disciplines to consider pressing issues. She would gather traditional owners, artists, 
scientists and educators to use their various skills to highlight pressures on the community and the country. She was a committed collaborator and believed that by sharing these endeavours, she harnessed the collective power to generate the best ideas. In later years, she also collaborated with her son and daughter, who, as I mentioned, are both respected artists in their own right. In 1995, Mandy moved to Central West New South Wales, where she lived with her husband, Dr Guy Fitzharding. In this setting, Mandy's work referenced the effects of drought, energy generation, coal and gold mining on the land, and the associated threat to the endangered ecological communities. Here, she continued to make prolific contributions to the ongoing discourse on the current climate emergency. Mandy was a lecturer at the ANU School of Art for an astonishing 25 years, where she mentored multiple generations of artists. She is remembered for being a teacher who set high standards for herself and her students. She was an inspiration in her fierce dedication to causes and her talent in communicating these in her work. One of, one of Mandy's legacies is inspiring a passion for art and its potential in her students. In 2008, Mandy was appointed as an adjunct professor in the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University here in Canberra. Mandy leaves a lasting legacy as a politically and socially engaged artist, an environmental campaigner, a generous and inspiring teacher, partner and parent, and a skilled and passionate collaborator dedicated to influencing change. Her obituary by Sasha Grishin reads, she felt strongly that it is the role of the artist to inspire others to join in the struggle, to restore our faith in the dignity of people and the sacredness of country. Mandy remained active in the studio until the very end, and her final large-scale collaborative work will premiere in Australia in November this year. Her legacy will live on in so many ways, not least an artist grant to be named in her honour, which will support creative responses to the climate crisis. It is with the deepest respect that we honour and celebrate her deep passion, ethics, and her enormous contribution to the arts. We are so lucky as a community to have been able to know and to experience Mandy Martin, and to continue to learn from her through her incredible skill of her art and her teachings, which will always live on. Her creations have enriched our local and national conversations about many important socio-political issues. The messages from these are gifts which will endure for generations. Her outstanding contribution as an educator ensures that her skill, her technique and knowledge as a painter live on in the practice of the many artists in our regions whom she taught. My thoughts are with her family and her friends at this very difficult time. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. Thank you, Minister Chain. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Declare the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive Business Notice Number One. I call the Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I present the COAG Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 together with its explanatory statement, including Human Rights Act compatibility statement. The Clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation to deal with the cessation of the Council of Australian Governments and for other purposes. Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. I move that this bill be agreed to in principle. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. I'll say from the outset that this is possibly the least exciting piece of legislation that, oh, this, wow. is, that this assembly will, uh, will debate uh, in this parliament. It comes about because on the 29th of May last year, uh, the National Cabinet agreed that the Council of Australian Governments, COAG, uh, would cease. It also agreed to form the National Federation Reform Council, 
as a joint forum of First Ministers and Treasurers from across all Australian jurisdictions and to include the President of the Australian Local Government Association in the Federation Reform Council. In June of last year, the newly established National Cabinet commissioned a review into former ministerial forums and councils to reset and rationalise COAG. In October, National Cabinet accepted the review's recommendations, including recommendation 30, that the Commonwealth, states and territories should introduce legislation uh, to amend outdated references to COAG councils and ministerial forums. So that is why we are here today, Mr Assistant Speaker. The bill that I am presenting will make amendments to outdated references to COAG and COAG ministerial councils and forums. And it will do so in the following acts. Dangerous Goods Road Transport Act, the Dangerous Goods Roads Transport Regulation, uh, the Health National Health Funding Pool and Administration Act, the Planning and Development Regulation, the Utilities Act and the Work Health and Safety Regulation of 2011. Introducing this bill will allow the government uh, to make the necessary changes to references to COAG in ACT legislation as soon as possible and reduce any potential legal risks posed by these outdated references. Uh, the bill has been drafted to include more flexible amendments, Mr Assistant Speaker, that will allow changes to the names of national and interjurisdictional ministerial level forums over time, and I'm sure this will occur. Uh, these names can and do change from government to government, parliament to parliament. This bill will allow this to occur in the future without the need for subsequent legislative amendments like the one I'm moving today. Traditional, uh, sorry, transitional arrangements have also been added to the bill to include the, the Health, National Health Funding Pool and Administration Act of 2013 and the Utilities Act of 2000. Uh, these uh, arrangements are to ensure that any decisions made by COAG, National Cabinet or the National Federation Reform Council, as well as the, uh, the Standing Council uh, or any health ministers' meetings, have effect after the Act commences. In response uh, to the Conran Review recommendations, uh, the review that was commissioned by National Cabinet, all states, territories and the Commonwealth will conduct their own legislative reviews and make similar amendments uh, to state, territory and Commonwealth legislation over coming months. These amendments will provide a necessary update to relevant legislation. Uh, I believe doing it this way will support greater efficiency in the future by effectively future-proofing references to national governing bodies uh, if and when, I think if uh, and when, there are subsequent changes to the federal relations architecture uh, in the months and years ahead. This will ensure ACT legislation remains current and relevant. Therefore, Mr Assistant Speaker, I commend this dull but worthy bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Chief Minister. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that debate be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Oh, of course it is. If it were a snake, it would have bitten me. The question now is that the resumption of debate be made in order of the day of the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive business notice number two. I call Minister Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I present the COVID-19 Emergency Response Check-in Information Amendment Bill 2021, together with its explanatory statement, including its Human Rights Act compatibility statement. The clerk. Of course. <clears throat> Don't run on my account. It's all good. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act 2020. Minister Stephen Smith. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I move that this bill be agreed to in principle. Minister. Question. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> the question is this bill be agreed to in principle. Minister Stephen Smith. Thank you. Uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, the COVID-19 Emergency Response Check-in Information Amendment Bill 2021 proposes a set of amendments 
to strengthen privacy protections applying to personal information collected through the Check-In Canberra app. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, contact tracing teams have been working to respond to positive cases, support individuals who are in isolation or quarantine, and to minimise the impact of COVID-19 outbreaks within the community. The contact tracers in ACT Health have done an incredible job of keeping Canberra safe and strong through their ongoing contact tracing operations. Experiences across the country have demonstrated the importance of ensuring that we are well placed to efficiently respond to outbreaks in the ACT through swift and effective contact tracing efforts. Mandatory check-in has been adopted nationally in response to the recommendations of the National Contact Tracing Review, a report for Australia's National Cabinet, which set out the characteristics of optimal contact tracing and COVID-19 outbreak management systems. Check-in requirements are currently detailed in the Public Health Check-in Requirements Emergency Direction 2021, number two, which states that restricted businesses and venues, as well as retail settings, public tra transport and taxi and rideshare services across the ACT, are required to register for and use the Check-in Canberra app to collect contact information of anyone aged 16 years and older who enters the premises or uses a service. The ACT Government's Check-in Canberra app was developed by ACT Health Directorate officials to provide a fast, easy and secure mechanism to record the attendance of individuals who have entered a restricted premise in line with the Public Health Emergency Declaration. The Check-in Canberra app has proven to be incredibly successful. Following the launch of the Check-in Canberra app on the, in September 2020, more than 17,000 venues have registered with the app. The app has been downloaded more than 900,000 times, and there have been over 30 million check-ins. Canberrans have clearly embraced the use of the Check-in Canberra app, and it continues to be an important tool in our defence against the transmission of COVID-19 in the ACT. The personal data collected through the Check-in Canberra through Checking Canberra is collected and st securely stored by ACT Health and deleted after 28 days. Personal information is only accessed if it is required for contact tracing purposes to ensure health authorities are able to quickly and effectively identify potential close and casual contacts of a positive case. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT Government recognises the need for strong privacy protections of the information collected through the Checking Canberra app. Although the Check in Canberra privacy policy clearly outlines the way in which personal information is stored and accessed, this bill provides additional clarity around the security of this information and adds some further restrictions to when the information can be accessed for the purposes of investigation and prosecution. The amendments will entrench within the Act the key aspects of the privacy policy, namely that the information is provided directly to and stored by ACT Health and that it is stored for 28 days and is then deleted unless a person is subject to an investigation or prosecution for failing to comply with the public health direction or provides false or misleading information and can only be used for contact tracing and contract tracing compliance purposes. Provisions of this bill will effectively displace the ability of a state or territory court or tribunal to compel production of documents, records or information collected by the app. Information collected through, through Checking Canberra will only be admissible as evidence in a court proceeding for the purposes of investigating or prosecuting an offence for failing to comply with a public health direction relating to contact tracing. This is similar to key components of Western Australian legislation to protect information for COVID-19 contact tracing in relation to the Safe WA app. The amendments proposed in this bill also seek to establish new offences to safeguard the appropriate use of both the Check-in Canberra app and Check-in Canberra information, or Check-in information, which is information collected for contact tracing purposes about the presence of a person at a particular place at a particular time. To that end, an offence is included which would prevent persons who are defined as authorised collectors of check-in information, other than an authorised person at, at, at the ACT government, from collecting contact tracing information in a way other than through the Check-in Canberra app or an alternative way permitted under the public health direction or by an exemption from the Chief Health Officer. This is intended to prevent unauthorised third party <laughs> systems or persons from being used to collect check-in information. Furthermore, an offence is also included in the bill prohibiting the unauthorised use of check-in information. The proposed offences in the bill would prohibit the collection of information for contact tracing purposes by an authorised collector other than through direct entry of information into the Check-in Canberra app or in a way permitted under the Public Health Direction, including any exemption given by the Chief Health Officer. The use of check-in information by anyone other than an authorised person or an authorised collector 
who discloses check-in information to an authorised person in accordance with the Public Health Direction. Failing to take reasonable steps to protect check-in information that is held by an authorised collector for, from misuse, interference or loss, or from unauthorised access, modification or disclosure. And an authorised collector failing to take reasonable step steps to destroy check-in information at the end of the contact tracing period where it is held by the authorised collector, that is, within 28 days or another period prescribed by legislation, unless the information is required for contact tracing or to investigate a breach of the direction. The commencement of the offence provisions in, within the bill will be delayed by 30 calendar days, which will, will provide for a grace period for government compliance and enforcement agencies to engage with businesses and undertakings and allow businesses to modify their operations to bring them into line with the legislation. In introducing this bill today, I acknowledge the public contributions of the Human Rights Commission seeking to ensure the protection of personal information from being obtained through compulsion by court or tribunal. We're confident that ACT Policing understands the vital importance of maintaining public confidence in the Checking Canberra app. While we are confident in that, the, the government has considered the concerns expressed by the Human Rights Commission and recent developments in Western Australia. We are therefore bringing forward these legislative amendments to en enhance confidence in the privacy protections of the personal information collected through the Checking Canberra app. This bill will provide further confidence for Canberrans that checking the Checking Canberra app information will continue to be used only for contact tracing purposes and to support compliance with public health directions and that their personal information will be protected. Mr Assistant Speaker, ACT Health's ability to conduct efficient contact tracing is vital in our pandemic response, enabling the effective management of cases and outbreaks should they arise. We continue to be well placed in the ACT in our response to COVID-19. However, we are reliant upon Canberrans following, continuing to follow the public health advice, which includes checking in when they are out and about. With the introduction of this bill, Canberrans can remain confident that their personal privacy through the Check-In Canberra app will be protected in legislation. I commend the bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister Stephen Smith. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. The question now is that the resumption of debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. Declare the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive Business Order of the Day number one, Crimes Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, resumption of debate on the question that this bill be agreed to in principle. I call Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. The Canberra Liberals support this bill. It makes amendments to several laws with the aim of improving the clarity and effectiveness of criminal justice legislation in the ACT. I particularly note and welcome the proposed amendments to the Crimes <coughs> Sentencing Act 2005 to mandate that the court consider certain factors when sentencing for a family violence offence. In May, I, as Shadow Attorney General on behalf of the Canberra Liberals, released an exposure draft open for consultation on the Crimes Family Violence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. Domestic and family violence is a scourge on our society and has significant detrimental impacts on the short and long-term health and well-being of victims subjected to this violence. Whilst, of course, Mr Assistant Speaker, no form of violence is acceptable, family violence perpetrated within the bounds of a trusting relationship is particularly abhorrent and should be treated with proportionate severity under our laws. At the time, I noted with disappointment of the delays in this government taking action to address these serious community concerns, which led me to releasing the exposure draft. And so today I welcome the Attorney General's inclusion in this bill of these new provisions. I also thank all the stakeholders, the legal fraternity and the community organisations who took the time to provide feedback, not only on this bill, but also my exposure draft also. I note the proposed amendments to the Inspector of Correctional Services Act 2017. This amendment extends the period in which uh, periods of review must be undertaken from at least once every two years to at least once every three years. This change aims to provide more time to implement, review and evaluate the inspector's recommendations. The Office of the Inspector of Corrections fulfils a vital oversight role in our city. 
The inspector oversees a facility where detainees are deprived of their liberty and are at their most vulnerable to government negligence. I thank the inspector for his hard work since the inception of the role in 2017, at a time where this government's mismanagement of the AMC is at such an abhorrent level, the role of the inspector has never been so important. The inspector has rightfully pointed out the challenges faced by staff at the AMC, including increases in overtime hours, the lack of de-escalation training and the need for further support to our correctional officers when dealing with violent riots, as we have seen in recent months. Whilst we support the extension of the review period, the Canberra Liberals will be following the government's implementation of the inspector's recommendations closely. Mr Assistant Speaker, this bill also makes important changes to the Crimes Child Sex Offenders Act 2005, which makes provisions around the registering of those convicted of Commonwealth offence um, of possession of a childlike sex doll or a similar object. Uh, also to the Crimes Surveillance Devices Act 2010 and Listing Devices Act 1992 <coughs> excuse me, to provide the legality for and to specify the circumstances in which body-worn cameras may or must be used by police officers. The key elements are they must be worn only in the course of police duties, the use must be overt and must be used in dealings with members of the public. The bill also makes changes to the Terrorism Extraordinary Temporary Powers Act 2006, which extends the operation of that act by a year. Without that extension, uh, the bill, uh, sorry, the legislation would expire and those powers would expire uh, in November of this year. The Canberra Liberals support these amendments. They provide greater certainty and legislative clarity for courts during their proceedings and seek to provide protection and support for our valued police and corrections officers. Mr Assistant Speaker, however, as with any legislation enacted in good faith and with good intentions, it's always about the implementation. We need to ensure that these amendments enhance and improve our laws and achieve the outcomes they were intended for. And the Canberra Liberals will keep a close eye on the ongoing operation of these laws. Thank you, Ms Lee. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Minister Gentleman. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And I'm pleased to speak in support of the Crimes Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. Across my portfolio areas, I'm acutely aware of the factors that are vital in fostering a safe, human rights-based criminal justice system. Now, this legislation highlights many of these factors and demonstrates the government's ongoing commitment to ensuring our criminal justice system operates as effectively as possible, provides protection for vulnerable people, supports our police in the field, and meets the community's rightly high expectations. Amendments to the Crimes Surveillance Device, Devices Act 2010 and the Listening Devices Act 1992 will support the use of body-worn cameras by police officers in various situations and clarify the circumstances where body-worn cameras may or must be used by ACT policing. Body-worn cameras are widely used by police nationally and internationally and have often been critical to achieving justice for various individuals. Although ACT policing has used body-worn cameras in various situations since 2019, it's important that there is transparency and clarity regarding the use of this tool, which is something these amendments provide. Under these provisions, police will explicitly be empowered to use body-worn cameras in a range of different situations. This use must generally be overt. However, there are some expectations uh, to this where overt use would cause or increase the risk of safety to a person. The amendments complement existing legal frameworks, including Commonwealth legislation that govern the use of devices by law enforcement to make audio or visual recordings in a range of situations and locations. They've been modelled on similar provisions in Section 50A of the Surveillance Device Devices Act 2007, New South Wales, and clarify that a police officer must use a body-worn camera in the course of all of their duties, and irrespective of whether the use occurs in public or private premises. Guidelines developed by the Chief Police Officer will include specific requirements about accessing, storing, retaining and using recordings captured by body-worn cameras to ensure the right to privacy is protected. 
These guidelines will necessarily be consistent with the privacy protections established by the amendments to the Act. The footage captured by body-worn cameras will provide evidence to assist all parties in criminal proceedings, including a defendant, therefore indirectly supporting a person's rights during criminal proceedings. These arrangements will promote the safety of police officers and members of the community, increase transparency around police conduct and aid police in gathering high quality evidence in a timely and effective way. They'll also ensure that the benefits of using body wood cameras can be extended to all areas of the community policing environment. Mr Assistant Speaker, the bill also improves protection for children by amending the modernisation of the Crimes, Crime Sector Offenders Act 2005 to include new types of child sex offences in the registration scheme. It adds the Commonwealth offence of possessing a childlike sex doll to facilitate registration of offenders convicted of the Commonwealth offence. Including this additional Commonwealth offence is a potential registrable offence under the scheme allows ACT policing to protect our community from child sex offenders. This amendment seeks to enable the police to address the potential escalation of offending at an earlier stage, for example, from a non-contact offending to a contact offending. Uh, evidence suggests that non-contact offending, such as possession of a childlike sex doll, can be indicative of an increased risk of re-offending, often in an escalating way as the commission of sexual assault. Placing an offender on the registrar facilitates better visibility of the offender for police and consequently increased protection for the community. The bill also makes amendments to the Inspector of Corrections Service Act 2017 by extending the review period for examining and reviewing correctional facilities from at least once every two years to at least once every three years. However, this does not prevent the Inspector of Correction Services from conducting more frequent reviews where appropriate. This sees the more flexible and targeted use of government resources to address specific issues that might arise in relation to the ACT corrections system. The bill also extends the Terrorism Extraordinary Temporary Powers Act 2006 for 12 months from the 19th of November 2021 to the 19th of November 2022 to allow further consideration of opportunities for enhancing the right to liberty in a way that still supports the security of Canberrans. At this time, the powers in the Act have not been used and no preventative orders have been applied uh, for or made by SC Policing. However, with the passage of time since the Act was introduced, it's important that we give careful consideration to the balance of rights in the Act and whether any adjustments can or should be uh, simultaneously supported uh, for national security and protect the rights of individuals. Finally, the bill makes important changes to the Crimes Sentencing Act 2005 in respect to sentencing for family violence offences uh, to better protect victims of family violence and better respond to family violence offending in a way that considers the circumstances of an offender and the offence that they have committed. The government is committed to introducing measures to address and prevent family violence in our community. This amendment reflects the government's effect, uh, efforts to continually review and improve the response to our criminal justice system to family violence offending. Amending the sentencing framework in this way seeks to ensure the safety, basic human rights and the well-being of all citizens is supported and protected by the criminal justice system and legislation that we have in place. This bill provides a clear signal that the ACT government is ready and willing to act to ensure our laws are secure enough to protect the community and meet their standards and nuanced enough to consider the specific circumstances and situations that individuals in contact with the criminal justice system may be experiencing. I commend the bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Gentlemen, the question is that the a motion be agreed to in principle. Bill be agreed to in principle. Minister Rattenbury. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. The Crimes Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 makes changes to five pieces of legislation to support efforts to keep vulnerable people safe, support police in our community, and to make sure our criminal justice system functions in line with the community's expectations 
particularly in addressing matters, matters of domestic and family violence. I thank the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety for the comments provided in Scrutiny Report 7, which identified opportunities to improve the explanation of the intent and proposed effect of the amendments. To that end, I table a revised explanatory statement for the bill to address those comments. Uh, turning to the subject matter of the bill, firstly, this bill includes important amendments to the Crime Sentencing Act 2005 to address the severity of family violence offences, as has been noted by the other speakers today. These amendments make changes to sentencing laws to require the courts to consider additional factors when sentencing for family violence offences. The amendments to this Act support various rights under the Human Rights Act 2004, including the right to protection from torture and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment, protection of family and children, and the right to liberty and security of person. They do this by putting measures in place to adequately address perpetrator behaviour on sentence and reduce the risk of further physical and psychological harm to victims of family violence. These amendments aim to consider the nature of family violence and the context of family violence offences. In doing this, they increase protections for vulnerable members of the community by ensuring that the court considers sentencing factors, such as whether the offending occurred in a private setting and whether children were present at the time of the offending. This is the first of a two-stage set of reforms to address issues identified by the Court of Appeal in the Crown and UG in February 2020. The government continuously seeks to develop legislation that reflects community standards when dealing with family violence offences. The first stage, reflected in this bill, creates a requirement for courts to consider family violence as a separate factor in sentencing for a family violence offence. This is to ensure that courts can adequately respond to deter family violence, engage with the need to prevent it, and protect the community. The second stage will likely require consideration of family, family violence as an aggravating sentencing factor. Government has heard from stakeholders their strong support for the introduction of an aggravated offence approach. We need to ensure that the courts have every appropriate tool available with which to respond to family violence, while also acknowledging a proposal like this is complex and its effectiveness will depend on the detail. This consideration will be complete before government's bill later this year to make a range of other family violence reforms. This bill also amends the Crimes Child Sex Offenders Act 2005 to add the Commonwealth offence of possession of a childlike sex doll to the schedule of offences that can result in an offender being on the Child Sex Offenders Register and having to meet reporting requirements under the Act. The purpose of the Registrable Offence Scheme is to reduce reoffending or escalation of offending and to protect children from potential predators. This reflects the community expectation that the government will maintain laws that support the safety and protection of children from sexual assault and violence. Adding the Commonwealth offence to this scheme helps police to monitor registrable offenders in order to protect the lives and sexual safety of children in the ACT and across other Australian jurisdictions making sure that the ACT is not perceived as a safe haven for people wanting to commit child sex offences. Given the potential breadth of application of the Commonwealth offence, additional safeguards have been included for the courts to consider when making an order to register an offender convicted of the Commonwealth offence. The outcome is that people convicted of the Commonwealth offence or possessing a childlike sex doll will be added to the register unless they fall within limited exceptions including where the court is satisfied that the offender is not a risk to the lives or sexual safety of children. These amendments promote the right of protection of family and children and the right to protection from torture and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment under the Human Rights Act 2004 by increasing the protection of children and reducing the opportunities for offenders to re-offend. The amendments engage and limit the rights of privacy of people convicted of the Commonwealth offence of possessing a childlike sex doll in a justifiable and deliberate way. However, the amendments do not expand the existing restrictions which apply to registered child sex offenders. The amendment serves to keep children safe from sexual predators and the addition of the Commonwealth offence to the Registrable Offences Scheme is appropriate in the circumstances, particularly when considered with the additional safeguards I mentioned earlier. The bill amends the Crimes Surveillance Devices Act 2010 
and the Listening Devices Act 1992 to support the use of body-worn cameras by police officers who are performing their duties in various situations, including public and private premises. These amendments provide a dual benefit of supporting our law enforcement officials with their capacity to collect evidence in criminal investigations and also strengthening community confidence in police integrity by supporting scrutiny of police activities. These amendments explicitly authorise police use of body-worn cameras in a range of different contexts. The circumstances and conditions for use of body-worn cameras include the requirement that police use their body-worn cameras in circumstances where they are dealing with the public, subject to specified exceptions. These exceptions are limited to circumstances where the use is not reasonably practicable, could cause or increase a risk to a person's safety, or would re unreasonably limit a person's privacy. Further, police may only use a body-worn camera in the course of their duties, and their use must be overt, including through police advising people that the camera is recording. There are limited exceptions to this requirement for overt use. These include when a firearm or conducted electrical weapon is drawn or used. The value of this footage is crucial to police accountability, such that it outweighs the increased privacy impact on people who may not be aware they are being filmed using a body-worn camera, or if it would create or increase a risk to a person's safety. This ensures that if a police officer has activated a body-worn camera, the officer is not required to announce or otherwise draw attention to the camera if it would be unsafe to do so. The use of body-worn cameras to rec record these interactions, as well as the retention and use of footage by police, does place a limitation on privacy. However, the amendments comprise of a range of measures to ensure that body-worn body camera use achieves its legitimate operational and accountability purposes, while limiting disproportionate or arbitrary impact on the right to privacy. Guidelines will be issued by the Chief Police Officer as a disallowable instrument to detail the circumstances in which body-worn cameras can and must be used, including examples of exceptional circumstances when use is not required or appropriate. The guidelines must also contain a statement about how human rights have been considered in their development. The bill also amends the Terrorism Extraordinary Powers Act 2006 to extend it for 12 months from its current end date of the 19th of November 2021 to 19th of November 2022. This follows a recent review of the operation and effectiveness of the Act, which highlighted the importance of striking the appropriate balance between implementing legislation that is consistent with terrorism legislation introduced in other jurisdictions in accordance with the national agreements and promoting the human rights of those who are detained under these laws. Previously, this Act has been extended for five years at a time without amendment. This 12-month extension of the Act allows for a greater consideration of and consultation on ways to uphold the right to personal liberty while ensuring legislation supports community safety and security in the face of potential terrorist threats. Finally, the bill amends the Inspector of Correctional Services Act 2017, which promotes the right, the right to humane treatment when deprived of liberty by extending the time allowed for the Inspector of Correctional Services to undertake periodic reviews of correctional centres and detention places. The Inspector of Correctional Services sought this amendment to allow sufficient time between reviews for the corrections facilities to implement any recommendations from reviews that have already been conducted. This will improve the way our correctional centres and detention places maintain their conditions and comply with human rights by replacing the current two-year review cycle with a three-year review cycle to support the effective response and implementation of review outcomes by the Inspector of Correctional Services. I note that importantly, this does not prevent the Inspector of Correctional Services from conducting more frequent reviews where appropriate. Extending the review cycle will allow directorates and agencies to fully consider and implement recommendations, particularly ones requiring lengthy implementation processes, before the next cyclical review. It will also reduce the administrative burden involved in preparing for and responding to the Inspector of Correctional Services reports by staggering the review and response timeframes, which allows for more efficient management of government resources. Overall, this bill demonstrates the government's strong ongoing commitment to improving the criminal justice system and outcomes for the people who are in contact with it. 
It shows that this government greatly values the human rights of all citizens and that we will continue to listen and work with the community and our stakeholders to ensure our laws meet the justif justifiably high expectations of our community. I commend the bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister Rattenbury. The question is that this bill be agreed to in principle. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Declare the ayes have it. Is it the wish of the Assembly to dispense with the detail stage? Yes. The question is that the bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Executive Business Order of the Day number two, update on ACT Infrastructure Plan, Ministerial Statement, resumption of debate on the motion of Mr Barr that the paper be noted. I call Minister Chain. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I'm pleased to speak on this ministerial statement uh, today. As the Chief Minister said um, a month or two ago, the ACT Infrastructure Plan is a blueprint for our city's development and a vision for the future. The 2019 Infrastructure Plan acknowledges the key role that cultural facilities play in the city's infrastructure. As our creative industries grow and develop, a strong network of community-level facilities is required to foster talent and build the pipeline of tomorrow's talented creators and creatives. To respond to this growing demand, the ACT Government has been investing in our 13 government-owned arts facilities to ensure that safe and fit-for-purpose creative spaces are available for arts activity to flourish in the region. The $15 million Stage 2 of the Belconnen Arts Centre opened to the public in August 2020, and it includes a new theatre, exhibition space, rehearsal space and events kitchen. The new flexible theatre space can hold up to 400 seated patrons, with the added flexibility of multiple stage and seating configurations to allow for a variety of audience experiences. And I've been very pleased to have attended on multiple occasions now and to see um, the variety uh, of the ways that, that, that it can be configured undertaken. The expansion of the Belconnen Arts Centre is part of the ACT's government's commitment to providing better infrastructure for our growing community. The centre offers an environment that is accessible and it's engaging to all, and it encourages the community to in interact and participate in the arts. Projects underway to meet the ongoing demand for creative spaces in the ACT include those being funded under the Upgrading Local Arts Facilities Program, where $1.675 million was allocated in 2019-20 over three years. Safety upgrades at Ainsley and Gorman House Arts Centres are being funded from this program. The final design for a major refurbishment project at Gorman House Arts Centre is also funded from this program. It will provide the documentation required for the construction phase. The government has committed $8 million to this construction project at Gorman House in the coming years to celebrate its 50th year as a community arts facility in 2024. Recent investment, totalling $880,000 over four years in arts facilities, including $245,000 in the last financial in this financial year. I'm sorry, no, last financial year. I will get the month right has enabled upgrades to five arts centres across the ACT. Ainsley Arts Centre, Gorman House Arts Centre, Strathnan Arts, Tuggeranong Arts Centre and the Watson Arts Centre. These upgrades have focused on improvements to aged heating and cooling systems. The Better Infrastructure Fund in the last financial year has invested $315,000 in arts facilities. Works have included the replacement of the heating and cooling system in the main theatre at the Street Theatre, as well as refurbishment of its costume and props storage area. Works have also been completed at Strathnan Arts, including upgrades to the kiln shed roof and the public toilet facility. And I was just at Strathnan Arts on the weekend viewing the Squares exhibition, and I'll give it a shout out. It's highly worth attending and viewing. A $5.9 million investment in a major refurbishment of the former transport depot at Kingston is also underway and nearing completion. Upgrades include new roofing, new lighting, a new electrical system and public toilet upgrades. 
As I spoke about in the Assembly in early June, the former transport depot will reopen soon, following the building remediation required due to the lead dust found during construction. The first event at the site will be the city's beloved old bus depot markets, which I'm delighted to hear, and I'm sure all Canberrans are too. The depot is a key community facility which is centrally located within what will be the Kingston Arts Precinct. The ACT government's investment in the depot is part of the overall investment being made in the broader site known as the Kingston Arts Precinct. Investment in this precinct is the government's next major commitment to arts infrastructure in Canberra and the biggest commitment to the visual arts to date at $78 million. It will include a new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art space, purpose-built facilities for the Canberra Contemporary Art Space, Craft ACT, M16 Art Space and Photo Access, who are joining Canberra Glassworks and Megalo Print Studio as founding resident organisations. Combined with accommodation for visiting artists, a theatre, Workshop space, outdoor event space for 5,000 people, 2,000 square metres of retail activation and a multi-storey car park. The precinct is Canberra's future place for celebrating and strengthening creative and cultural practices. And the organisations I mentioned have recently undertaken uh, some facilitated workshops uh, and I know that there were um, some excellent ideas and collaboration that came out of that. In addition to the Kingston Arts Precinct, a new Canberra Theatre Precinct in the city was also highlighted in the 2019 ACT Infrastructure Plan. The new Theatre Precinct is a priority for the ACT Government in the coming years. We're continuing to work on completing the design work and business case to create new jobs and attract bigger shows and concerts to the ACT. The Cultural Facilities Corporation recently received a total of $428,000 in better infrastructure funding in the past financial year. This funding allowed several priority projects to take place during the year. The major allocation from this amount, $145,000, was used to purchase new carpet for the Canberra Theatre Centre, to be replaced both for safety reasons and to ensure the presentation of the centre is maintained at an appropriate standard for the region's premier performing arts venue. I was interested to hear that the new carpet reflects the history and heritage of the Canberra Theatre Centre by incorporating the design used for the original house curtains for the Canberra Theatre. Francis Burke's black opal design. While the carpet was purchased this year in order to fit in with theatre programming schedules, which I'm pleased to say are still looking quite busy, even with the effects from Sydney, it will be installed progressively during the course of this financial year. As the Chief Minister stated, 2021 is an opportune time to update the ACT infrastructure plan. And I look forward to being part of this process to ensure we continue to provide access to high quality facilities for, for participating in arts and cultural activities across the ACT. And I commend his statement. Thank you, Minister Chain. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. Our region and our city have changed significantly since the government released the ACT infrastructure plan in October 2019. The dry, hot summer which followed the plan's release saw bushfires rage across the continent. Neighbouring parts of New South Wales were destroyed by blazes during the Christmas holiday period. And in January, fire swept through our backyard in the Aurora Valley and Imagi National Park. The Ural Valley Fire was the most serious Canberra had faced since the deadly 2003 fires. In the aftermath of these fires, the truly devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic were being realised across the globe. In March 2020, the ACT declared a public health emergency, and it's far uh, fair to say that our way of life has changed. The seismic emergencies of national and global significance remain a threat. If we've learned anything since the summer of 2019-20, it's that emergencies of one form or another are constant in our lives. While we do all we can possibly to avoid emergencies, the reality is we cannot stop them all from occurring. In my ministerial portfolio, I'm pleased um, and, and very interested to know how as a community and government we respond to emergencies. Uh, and I could not be prouder. I'm proud of the dedication shown by our hardworking men and women of ACT Policing and the Emergency Services Agency, 
who provide the frontline support to keep our community safe. And I'm proud of the many volunteers who are so willing to give up their time to help the community during traumatic times. I'm very proud of our correction staff who work to rehabilitate offenders and provide them with opportunities to make a life for themselves away from the criminal justice system. These people make our community a safer and therefore a better place to live. And the ACT government will continue to support the commitment and dedication of those women and men by investing in the capital works and projects to help them do their jobs effectively. As the population grows beyond a half a million in the next decade, we know a, a well thought out plan is needed to ensure that all Canberrans have appropriate access to police and emergency services. We're already delivering on a pipeline of projects listed in the 2019 infrastructure plan. In the 2019-20 budget, the government provided over $9 million over four years to improve the existing ACT policing accommodation infrastructure. Furthermore, in line with the 2019 infrastructure plan, a new accommodation solution for the road policing is in process of being delivered. And I've recently announced that a 15-year lease has been signed for the new road policing centre site at Hume. The ACT government provided nearly $5 million in funding to fit out the modern facility and relocate some 80 police from the current traffic operations centre in Belconnen in March next year. The new facility is on a 6,000 square metre site which will fit the needs of a growing police force into the future. It will include office space, training rooms, labs, workshops, storage and vehicle parking. In addition to supporting the growing needs of police, the government is working with ESA to help it meet community expectation and response times. This includes the support needed for both the volunteer and paid workforce. More than $40 million has been committed to the construction of a joint ACT fire and rescue and ACT ambulance service station at Acton. This will support the ESA to deliver timely servicing for these critical functions to the city and its surrounds. In addition, the government's also looking at improving its police and emergency services footprint in Canberra's north. Work's also progressing to better meet the emergency service and policing needs of communities living in the Gungahlin region. The focus on investment in corrections is around improving support for detainees and providing the best opportunity for them to be reintegrated into the community. As Minister, I have acknowledged reform and improvement are critical to better outcomes in ACT prisons. This is being backed up by the investment in areas to improve the system. And I wish to acknowledge the hard work corrections officers do do. I'm constantly impressed at the work they do in challenging circumstances and assure them they will be provided with as much support as possible to do these difficult jobs. Our police, Emergency services and correction staff play an important role in making the ACT such a livable city, and I'm honoured to be their minister. As we move towards developing an updated infrastructure plan, the focus will be on ensuring a strategic approach to infrastructure investment to support and sustain these critical services for our community. The community has a great deal of admiration for our police officers and emergency services and correction staff. For them to keep doing such a wonderful job, it's important the government continues to invest wisely so when the next emergency hits, we are placed well to protect and support the members of our community. The government will continue to invest in the critical infrastructure to protect the community. And Mr Assistant Speaker, the plan is also playing an important role in the growth and development of our city. The infrastructure plan is importantly linked with the ACT planning strategy and indicative land release program that I'm responsible for. The infrastructure plan is an integral part of delivering on the vision and directions of the ACT planning strategy and conversely planning is essential in informing and developing a comprehensive and integrated infrastructure plan for the city. In particular, the strategy supports sustainable urban growth by working towards delivering up to 70% of new housing within Canberra's existing urban footprint. The remaining 30% of new housings being delivered through greenfield development, with the Malonglo Valley our main greenfield front at present. As well as providing homes for our growing population, housing infrastructure investment is a cornerstone of job creation. Delivery of affordable housing is a particular focus of the housing strategy. Mr Assistant Speaker, 
Our environment is also part of the infrastructure plan and enormously important to this city and Canberrans and their wellbeing. The Malonglo River Park, which winds its way from downstream of Scriven Dam to where the Malonglo River meets the Murrumbidgee, is a defining natural feature of the new Malonglo Valley development. This government is committed to protecting the river corridor. Now, as part of this, we are progressively investing in endangered species habitat, restoration, and in new recreational facilities for residents and visitors. In closing, Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT Infrastructure Plan provides a contemporary and sustainable approach to the growth of our city and the region. Thank you, Minister Gentlemen. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Berry. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I'm happy to speak today on the government's infrastructure progress and the priority priorities in my portfolio responsibilities. I've recently spoken in this place about the extensive capital works program for public schools. So members will be aware that as the city grows, the government is investing to grow our public school system. Recently, I was at Gold Creek's senior school campus for a smoking ceremony ahead of the project to expand the school by 200 places in time for the 2022 school year. The expansion is being conducted by Rourke Projects as part of the ACT government's commitment to providing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander enterprises opportunities with government procurement. The students I spoke with <coughs> at Gold Creek are so excited for the expansion and see this as more than just a building project, it's an opportunity to further develop their community. Along with that expansion, we'll also be opening a new primary school in Throsby and an expansion to Amaru School for the start of the next school year. As outlined this week in my responsibilities as Minister for Housing and Suburban Development, the ACT government is working hard to deliver the growing and renewing public housing program, providing more homes to suit the needs of the ACT community, because we understand that one model of housing doesn't suit anyone, everyone. The growing and renewing public housing program is ambitious, and together with our earlier public housing renewal program, represents a 10-year investment of over $1.3 billion from 2015 and the renewal of over 20 per cent of the ACT public housing portfolio. The current program builds on the success of the first public housing renewal program and the ACT standing as a national leader in the level of provision of public and social housing for the community. Under the public and parliamentary and governing agreement, the growing and renewing public housing program targets were expanded to deliver 400 new public housing dwellings by 2025, while renewing 1,000 public housing properties. The government is also committed to providing more dedicated, culturally appropriate long-term accommodation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, building on the success of Mura Ganya, opened in 2016. Housing ACT worked closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elected body to deliver the second complex Gunji Jindalin in Lyons, which opened in December 2020. Work is continuing on the third site at Dixon, named Ning Ningalanga, and recently I attended a traditional smoking ceremony to witness the cultural cleansing of the Ningalanga site. Ashes from the ceremony will be saved under the foundations to ensure new beginnings for residents. The ACT government is also on track <laughs> to deliver the new common ground in Dixon. Following the success of Common Ground in Gungahlin, work has been well underway with an anticip anticipated completion time of the third quarter of 2021-22. The Dixon development includes 40 units, 20 supportive and 20 affordable, with a mix of one, two and three bedroom dwellings, as well as communal and community spaces, on-site support services and the provision for social enterprises businesses. Last week, I visited the Common Ground Dixon site with Minister Vazzarotti to see the progress on the construction. And you can see the building is really taking shape now and I can't wait to welcome the new residents into the building once it's completed next year. The ACT government continues to look outside the traditional housing scope to provide social housing options across government and the community in order to increase housing support for Canberrans who need it. In partnership with ACT Health, Housing ACT built four homes to provide long-term supported accommodation for people living with mental illnesses. The dwellings constructed to the Class C adaptable standard to cater for mobility limitations 
have bedrooms with en suites and a dedicated meeting space, enabling tenants to live in a supported environment amongst the community. The ACT Government is delivering on these housing infrastructure programs to address the diverse changing needs of the Canberra community and to enable a sustainable supply of housing for individuals and families who need it most. And finally, in my portfolio responsibilities as Minister for Sport and Recreation, the ACT Government is committed to delivering more sporting facilities for a growing Canberra to help Canberrans stay active, healthy and engaged in the sports that they love. The ACT Government committed at the 2020 election to support Dragon Boat ACT as one of the largest water-based sports with a new home in Gravillia Park. The facility will include a new boathouse, storage facility and spectator area to support events. Tennis ACT as they continue to grow to beyond 32,000 players with a new facility in Gungarland. The centre will include up to 12 full-size courts with amenities including lead flood lighting, up to two hot shots courts, a pavilion, hitting wall and parking. <coughs> All the sporting organisations and clubs that use Philip Enclosed Oval with a new pavilion, upgraded grandstands and lights, as well as additional parking. New sports grounds will also be built in Stromlo Forest Park that will see at least two playing fields, flood lighting, a pavilion and parking, all delivered in this term of government. The ACT government also continues the improvement program to upgrade facilities across the ACT to be female friendly, to help remove barriers to participation in sport for women and girls. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT Government is continuing to deliver on its infrastructure priorities in my portfolio of responsibilities, including delivering modern schools for our school communities, sustainable public housing for Canberrans who need it, as well as sporting facilities for the future. Thank you, Minister Berry. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. I understand it's the wish of the Assembly to suspend for lunch. That being so, the chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. Thank you, members. Uh, with that, we'll move to question time. I would have handed it over. Leader Thank you, Madam Speaker. FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberal, Liberals reveal the government approved an exemption from procurement regulations requiring three written quotes for spending up to $200,000 to award a Darwin based developer the Choose Canberra contract. Bramium Labs got the job despite a government document revealing it did not have the capacity to provide 24-7 support, which it said, quote, may be desirable should there be system issues or outages, end quote. Minister, why did you give the job to a Darwin-based company that could not provide 24-7 support instead of following procurement rules and allowing Canberra companies to compete for the work? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Uh, I am aware uh, of the procurement decision that was undertaken. Uh, Ms Lee would have seen in those FOI documents uh, that this was at a, a delegation that was within the directorate uh, and uh, the, uh, the provider um, was uh, on the face of it value for money for us. I think it's important that everyone remember here that at the time that Choose CBR uh, was announced uh, that we would be pursuing a digital discount system like this, that this had only been conducted once. Uh, I appreciate that there are several other schemes or similar schemes uh, that have taken place uh, in all manner of things since, uh, but at the time just the Northern Territory had done this through the City of Darwin scheme. Uh, and so this provider appeared to be uh, value for money uh, and also uh, had a system that had a template which we could essentially uh, borrow. Uh, but this was a, a decision that was made within the directorate. Supplementary, Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what's the point of having government procurement regulations if you do not follow them? Ms Chay. Madam Speaker, I, I dispute uh, the... Uh, the 
nature of the question. I think, as Ms Lee pointed out uh, at her very first question, uh, that uh, this um, procurement, uh, the, the way it was undertaken, uh, was within the rules in terms of seeking an exemption. Ms Kessley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what do you say to the local ICT companies who would have welcomed the opportunity to tender for the Choose CBR rollout and have provided the 24-7 support? Ms Chain. Ms Kessley is one of the biggest critics in this place of the administrative uh, support. In the question, rather than answering it, and that is against the standing orders. I, I, well, whether I think the question was long enough into the debate, but to answer the question, Ms. Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I mentioned in my pre Madam Speaker, as I mentioned in my previous answers, we were looking for value for money here. We were looking for something that could be done quickly, uh, noting the circumstances of the pandemic at the time. Uh, this was a product that had already um, been. Uh, 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 issued. It had worked in Darwin. Uh, we had reviewed it. We wanted to do something similar. Uh, so it made sense to procure something off the shelf. Questions without notice? Mrs Jones. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Business. Minister, FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberals revealed you were warned about risks with the full two CBR rollout, including a low take-up by business and ICT security and fraud. Warning, the warning noted, for the full rollout, there is the potential for greater financial gain, which increases the overall risk, potential fraud or questionable transactions. It warned that there were limited mechanisms to fully monitor transactions and provide a higher level of assurance around information provided by businesses. <coughs> Minister, given these warnings about the increased risk of fraud and limited ability to detect it, why didn't you change the scheme? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are risks uh, with every scheme, uh, and as the opposition will note, given they have apparently read uh, the documents, but I'm not sure in how much detail, uh, when there are risks, we undertake a risk review. That's normal. Uh, and uh, with a scheme that has money uh, and, uh, and where we are uh, distributing that money, uh, there is a potential risk of fraud. Uh, and that's exactly why we engaged with PwC to undertake uh, a risk review. And we did put in place measures, uh, including uh, the spot checking and the auditing uh, that we were doing internally. And as the opposition well knows, uh, by doing that, it, it did uncover uh, some questionable transactions, uh, including in one case where we suspended three related businesses. Mrs Jones. Thank you. Minister, given you were warned you could not give a high level of assurance to the community about the integrity of the scheme, why did you persist with it in the way you did? Ms Chang. Madam Speaker, I'm not sure what the opposition is trying to get at here in terms of uh, the, the fraud uh, that they think has occurred here. Uh, we have put risks were identified risks were mitigated. Given the scheme was a $2 million scheme, I note that similar schemes in other jurisdictions are in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that also uh, have risks. Uh, I think uh, that uh, given we were wanting to uh, distribute money uh, and stimulate the economy uh, on the balance, uh, that uh, this was a low risk that is clear in the documents and we proceeded accordingly. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was just wondering if you can further outline the risk review around the CBR rollout. Ms Chain. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So um, the ACT government engaged PwC to complete a high-level risk review, uh, and that was prior to the trial in 2020. And the report did indicate that there were no known material issues or security breaches associated with the platform that we procured. It did identify a number of risks with technical or process mitigations that could be considered. 
And indeed, one of those was about uh, potentially a malicious actor compromising merchant credentials and financial details. And so we addressed these risks through changes to system design and through additional procedures. And we do have no reason to believe that the system was compromised in this way. Uh, undertaking these sorts of uh, risk reviews uh, is standard government procedure and uh, we were happy to undertake this uh, and respond accordingly. Questions without notice? Mr Hanson. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Business. Uh, FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberals reveal $230,000 of Canberra taxpayers' money was budgeted for communications, marketing and administration for the full two CBI rollout. This is despite you signing off on a ministerial brief on the 6th of May, which stated that the total proposed campaign is 154,000. The brief noted a more significant communications budget has enabled the use of a range of channels to reach more businesses and consumers. Minister, given less than 20% of eligible businesses benefited from the scheme, why are you so flippant with the Canberra taxpayers' money? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's well understood across industry uh, that uh, a communications campaign that is about 10% uh, of an overall spend uh, is pretty appropriate. And I know that the Canberra Liberals like to go on about only 20% of take-up. 20% of take-up was very large. We're able to support a huge number of businesses uh, through this. There was no flippancy here, and I absolutely dispute that. What we wanted was a strong take-up of the scheme. That's something that the opposition had criticised. This was a strong take-up of the scheme. We actively engaged with businesses. This was money well spent. But equally, I note that the money that was spent on this uh, we did not need to, to use it all uh, that was budgeted uh, because the scheme uh, was expended quickly. Uh, it did um, essentially promote itself uh, and so there were savings uh, and there were savings uh, that were achieved ultimately. Mr Hanson. You take responsibility for wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars of Canberra and money to promote a failed scheme that 80% of eligible businesses do not register for? Ms Chain. Uh, I don't agree with the premise of the question. Supplementary. Minister, how is it that you could so easily increase the budget for communications by 76,000? Ms Chain, you have the call. Madam Speaker, I'll take that question on notice. I need to review the documents. Questions without notice, Mr Davis. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Consumer Affairs. Minister, a few months ago I had the privilege of formally launching the Tuggeranong Repair Cafe organised by Sea Change, which I understand has grown to become the most popular repair cafe in Canberra. I think it speaks to how important Tuggeranites take our responsibility to recycle, reduce and reuse. Can you please tell me, uh, can you please, uh, tell me how, as Consumer Affairs Minister, you will advance the right to repair issue so that Canberrans can get products that are properly repairable, we can reduce e-waste and the environmental impact of consumer goods. Mr Brattenbury. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, the Tokenon Repair Cafe is a real success. I've met the organisers of it recently and they were very excited the fact that they now have to take bookings because so many people want to come along. It speaks to a growing community enthusiasm for the ability to repair goods. The, the notion of a right to repair is one that's emerged out of Europe and the US in different ways. And it speaks to the idea that you should be able to take your good to get it repaired, to get the spare parts for it, to be able to do that at an affordable cost and without breaching your warranty. These are the sort of issues that have arisen in this space. Uh, the ACT government has particularly promoted this issue. Uh, we took a proposal to the Consumer Affairs Forum of Ministers from Australia and New Zealand a couple of years ago now, and from that has led to the Productivity Commission report, which is currently in progress. Uh, members may have seen the Productivity Commission has released their draft report. Uh, that was open for consultation until I think just last week and they'll produce a final report later this year. This is really important in terms of empowering consumers uh, to be able to actually keep their products for as long as they want, to tinker with them, uh, to improve them, uh, and, but ultimately to, as Mr Davis has alluded to in his question, to minimise the amount of e-waste 
Uh, Australia particularly is an incredibly large producer of e-waste and being able to repair basic products like your phone uh, and various other devices is both good for the consumer and good for the planet. Supplementary, Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what can the ACT government do to continue to lead the nation on the right to repair? Mr Rattenbury. Well, Madam Speaker, I think a couple of things. One is we are continuing to advocate for this issue. It is really important that it is given a national voice because as a jurisdiction alone, we cannot bring in national right to repair rules. I need to get the other consumer affairs ministers on board, probably the national treasurer, and through the support of the Productivity Commission's report, really make the case that in Australia there is a market failing here and we need governments to step in and actually put requirements onto producers to produce goods that can be repaired to supply the spare parts and the like. I was very interested to see in the Productivity Commission's draft report, they've canvassed the idea of coming up with alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, including a binding conciliation power. Uh, members may be may recall that the ACT Assembly passed legislation to that effect uh, during the, towards the end of the last term, and that legislation is just about to come into effect where uh, Access Canberra will have the ability to compel a business uh, to come to the table with a consumer to resolve consumer matters under $5,000. So I was very pleased to see that South Australia have already done it, and now the ACT have already picked up some of the recommendations from the Productivity Commission, and I think this helps empower consumers uh, and give them that confidence uh, that they can, even if they have sort of repair, that this doesn't necessarily void the warranty. There are a lot of consumer myths out there, uh, and these sort of powers give consumers better prospects when it comes to making the case. Mr Braddock. Minister, what can our constituents do to support this work? Mr Ambry. Well, there's a real enthusiasm in the community, Madam Speaker, for people to get involved. I've been so impressed by the rise of repair cafes in the ACT. We've got, um, of course, the one at Toganong that Mr Davis asked about, the one at the Canberra Environment Centre, which is, I think, the original one here in Canberra. But in some ways, I think our men's sheds are the classic repair cafe where people are taking things, fixing them, putting them back together, um, zhushing them up, whatever. Uh, I don't know how Hansard's going to spell that, but <laughs> my apologies, Hansard. <laughs> uh, so I think there's that really practical element to it, uh, but there is a national movement, and I think for our constituents who are motivated by this, there are groups who are pushing this case. There is the opportunity to contribute to the uh, Productivity Commission's ongoing processes, and I think to make the case to various of our uh, parliamentary colleagues, particularly at the federal level, it is important that we receive, see reform in this space in Australia. Certainly in the European Union, they are increasingly adopting standards which require manufacturers to produce goods that don't have built-in obsolescence. They cannot be designed in a way that means you can't open them, you can't repair them. Uh, in the US, it's a, been a slightly different focus where it's been much more about farm machinery and the like, but also on auto vehicles. Uh, and so I think this is a very much a consumer-led campaign. And for those who are motivated by it, you know, there's a lot of research online and it's well worth getting involved in some of those campaigns. Questions without notice, Mr Patterson. Speaker, my question is for the Chief Minister. Chief Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the latest economic data for the Territory? Mr Barton. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank Mr Patterson for the question. Uh, uh, yes, I can. Uh, gross state product for the Territory grew by 2.4 per cent and the most recent data in a period where the Australian economy in fact went backwards by 0.3 of a percent. Our state final demand uh, grew by 2.1 per cent over the year to March 21. Uh, that's slightly above uh, Australia's GDP growth in that period of 1.8 per cent. Uh, retail trade turnover is up 7.3 per cent over the year to June 21. Uh, and retail spending is around 17.5 per cent above decade uh, average levels in the March quarter. Housing finance sees the number of owner occupy commitments up 47.5 per cent over the year to June 21. The number of first home buyer commitments is up 41 per cent, and the number of investment commitments uh, was up nearly 110 per cent, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, in the most recent data. Building approvals. The total number of residential dwellings approved increased by 31.3 per cent in June of 2021. I note the Property Council have put out their office market report 
uh, and the Property Council advised that the latest report for the ACT reveals strong market demand with the highest net demand of any commercial leasing sector in the country and the lowest vacancy rate uh, the Territory has seen since 2009, Madam Speaker. Now, of course, a strong public health response is essential to maintaining this economic activity and protecting and creating jobs. That's why the government is committed to delivering the vaccination rollout as effectively as possible, uh, subject, of course, to supply of vaccines from the federal government. We know that vaccines are the only way out of this pandemic. And Madam Speaker, yesterday we opened vaccination bookings to Canberrans in their 30s, uh, and nearly 21,000 bookings were made in a single day. That's four times the previous record, Madam Speaker. Your time has expired. Supplementary, Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, will the ACT government seek to partner with the Commonwealth Government to strengthen our economic recovery? Mr Barr. Uh, in short, yes, we will. Uh, we've been able to partner with the Commonwealth on a range of important infrastructure projects, such as light rail stage 2A, uh, the duplications of Gundaroo, Gundaroo Drive and William Hovell Drive, the upgrades to the Monero Highway and Tuggeranong Parkway and the Malonglo River Bridge crossing. Looking beyond these projects, Madam Speaker, we look forward to working with the Commonwealth to see a consolidation and revitalisation of the Australian Institute of Sport at Bruce, a boost to housing supply for the Territory at the former CSIRO Ginandera site, the rejuvenation of Commonwealth Park, the Commonwealth Avenue Bridge Renewal Project and the next stage of the Acton Waterfront development. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, have you raised any specific new proposals with the Commonwealth? Mr Barr. Yes, I have, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for the question. Uh, I've written to the Federal Treasurer uh, and the Minister for Tourism uh, requesting a nationally consistent approach to support tourism, hospitality, businesses and workers that have been affected by lockdowns outside of their state or territory. I've asked the Commonwealth to consider further extending the COVID-19 disaster payment to eligible employees in the tourism and hospitality sectors, including those in the ACT who have lost income as a result of outbreaks in other jurisdictions. We've been able to secure this support uh, for workers in this context where they were exposed interstate but undertook their isolation in the ACT. We've got them eligible for these payments, but we want to see this extended. The government will also continue to monitor impacts uh, locally on our economy as a result of the interstate lockdowns, and we will consider additional support if required. Questions without notice. Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. Chief Minister, last Friday morning on Chief Minister's talkback on local ABC radio, you said that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 km per hour speed limit in the new speed restriction areas in Civic. Chief Minister, have thousands of individual warning notices been issued to motorists exceeding the new speed limit prior to July 5? Mr Barr. Mr Chat. I guess I don't have direct responsibility for that. No, so I understand, yeah. but it's yeah. just it's based on your yeah. Well, I think, Ms Chain, I mean, the ministers can, um, responsible, yeah, answer the question. Ms Chain. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm sorry, Mr Pardon, could you please repeat the question? Oh, sorry, so, so it was in its entirety to the, to the Chief Minister. I said last Friday morning mm -hmm. on Chief Minister Talkback, you said that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 kilometre speed limit in the new speed restriction areas in Civic have thousands of individual warning notices been issued to motorists exceeding the new speed limit prior to July 5? Ms Chen? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The short answer to that uh, is no. Uh, from 5 July uh, until 26 July, that's the latest data that I have, uh, 18,437 infringement notices have been issued. Uh, however, um, between uh, in the two weeks, in the two week grace period, uh, there was a considerable communications uh, campaign uh, and that followed, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'll go into the detail of that communications campaign. 
that followed uh, nine uh, uh, items that had covered it uh, before the grace, covered the, um, the new 40 kilometre hour zone before the grace period. 11 um, uh, media items that uh, covered the grace period, and since then there have been at least seven um, media items. Um, variable messaging signs have been used in the area uh, between May, June and July. Uh, we've also uh, uh, had radio ads across multiple time slots on either side of the news during uh, peak hour to alert motorists uh, to this change. I do note that the change uh, came into place uh, in March. Uh, we did not start enforcing until July. There was a very long lead period. We had the grace period to alert as many Canberrans as possible. Uh, we had a social media post on our own ACT government channels, and I note that they've been on other channels, uh, including Canberra Notice Board Group, including on Reddit, uh, where there have been 1,400 comments uh, just on an ACT government social media account alone. Uh, but, Madam Speaker, to send uh, individual warning letters your time has expired and you have a supplementary and Mr Hanson, I'll ask you to be quiet. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, to whoever wants to answer it, um, why did the Chief Minister tell the public that thousands of warnings had been issued if that was in fact not the case? Mr. Thank you, Rob. Uh, my understanding was that there had been communication, extensive communication from the time uh, the speed zones changed in March to when uh, infringement notices were issued. If I made an error, I apologise for that. Obviously, in the context of Chief Minister Talkback, uh, there are potentially thousands of issues that can be raised. Uh, I, I don't. Mr. I don't Mr. have. Um, yeah. I don't have, obviously, instant recollection of every single thing. I do recall a discussion in relation uh, to this matter. If I got it wrong, I apologise. Nevertheless, the, the point stands that there have been months and months of discussion, warnings, speed signs, debate on this issue. Uh, and the fact that the speed has changed in that area has been very well canvassed uh, throughout the community. Uh, for a period of, uh, what, a third of a year now. Ms Lewis. Thank you, Chief. Madam Speaker. Um, Chief Minister or the Minister, uh, why won't you waive the low range speeding fines being incurred by thousands of Canberrans given that there were no warnings given and given clearly how ineffective the safety and the speed advisory measures appear to be? Ms Chan. Madam Speaker, that's a pretty extraordinary question, I have to say. There are 17 signs uh, around the three cameras, 17. Uh, and for Ms Lee uh, to take that approach, this is about road safety. Uh, this is about an area that has high pedestrian activity. That's exactly why we reduced uh, the, the speeds. Uh, this is an area that I think uh, the, the member for Currajong should be interested in enlivening. Uh, and and to, you know, when that we have had months and months of communications about this, when we have offered a grace period, when we have communicated regularly during the grace period about uh, the number of people who were speeding, that this had an extraordinary amount of media take-up, something that the Liberals can only dream of, I suspect. Uh, and, and to then take that approach, it is not usual practice to Members. issue warning letters for drivers. With 20,000 20, 20, people speeding through that time... Members. Members. Madam Speaker, with 20,000 vehicles detected committing an offence, Sending a warning letter to every single driver would have been a manual process, which would have been a significant diversion of resources. Sending a warning letter, we would have immediately had you criticising it. So you can't have it both ways, Mr Hanson. Members, questions without notice. Mr Milligan. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Business. FOI documents about two CBR obtained by the Canberra Liberals reveal all reasonable load tests were carried out on the site when the vouchers were deployed. 
However, an internal Treasury Directorate ministerial brief dated on May the 3rd states, the schedules allows a short window for user testing of the voucher redemption process. The brief also reveals the short time frame between decision and program launch means development and user acceptance testing timetables are compressed. Minister, do you take responsibility for failing to properly test the system which saw it crash just after one day? Ms Chang. Madam Speaker, there was a lot of testing uh, done on the system, but there was also an extraordinary take up of the system far beyond uh, anything that we had seen in the trial um, by a, a factor or a rate of knots that we just had not seen uh, in the trial. There had been significant uh, testing. There also was uh, quite a lot of communication uh, with um, the developer, uh, including um, past tests and, and making sure uh, that uh, it was uh, at a standard that we were ready to hit go on. Uh, given the amount of uh, interest uh, and communication about this, and that we had, you know, I had personally gone to businesses about this, I was confident uh, about uh, the launch of it. Uh, and I have said repeatedly that I am sorry uh, that it uh, was not able to hold up to the, the sheer volume that we had uh, on those first few days. Um, but we did do that further work that did uh, increase uh, the, the, the amount of loads that we were able to, to have on the website. And that's exactly what uh, resulted in the, the, the relaunch of it a week later, where we saw a considerable, uh, an, an even higher amount of transactions uh, where there were no issues reported, uh, something that the opposition conveniently forgets. Mr Milligan, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why did you rush the CBR scheme and compromise testing and making the program such a shamble? Ms. It wasn't Chang. rushed, Madam Speaker. Mrs Cookett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Minister, why didn't you allow more time for testing, given you were warned the short window of time meant testing would be compressed? Ms Chan. Madam Speaker, all reasonable tests were conducted in that time. Questions without notice? Ms Clay. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment. Minister, I recently went for a walk near Lawson Grasslands and learned about the critically endangered grasslands, boxgum woodlands and threatened species on the site, like golden sun moth, the striped legless lizard and the Purunga grasshopper. Lawson Grasslands are on, the national, are on national land and they are marked for future development by Defence Housing Australia. What consultations has the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate conducted about this proposed development with the National Capital Authority, Defence Housing Australia, the Department of Defence and their contractors. Ms Perserotti. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Ms Clay, for the question. Um, as as uh, Ms Clay you noted, this is actually national capital land, so the ACT government is not the decision maker um, on, this, um, on, on this site, and we do know that um, Defence Housing Australia, who is a, the administrators for the site, are proposing to put a, um, a housing development on that site. Um, as you also note, this is a, is a really important site in relation to the conservation, conservation values that it has, particularly around native temperate grasslands that is you know, very, um, very precious. And certainly in ACT, on ACT government land, we have protected a number of, um, of sites that have similar ecological values. In relation to consultation that has happened, to, um, happened today, ACT government conservation officers have actually undertaken a site visit on the 30th of June 2020 to discuss proposed um, development in Lawson with Defence Housing Australia. Um, with future development that will occur, um, it will be subject to environmental approval, um, particularly under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, and with the planning uh, with the plan and planning approval by the National Capital Act. So ACT government will be um, will be um, able to provide consultation, um, but but will not be the decision maker in that instance. Ms. Clay, supplementary. Do you think Lawson grasslands should be protected? Um, certainly, 
say the ecological values that have been identified on the site, um, particularly in terms of ecological community um, of the temperate grasslands and the woodland um, threatened um, threatened communities as well that have been confirmed on the site. It certainly meets me, meets the criteria that if this site was on ACT government land, I think we would absolutely look at protecting the site. Um, we do know that it does have um, elements on the site that means that it does need to be looked at in terms of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity and Conservation Act. Sadly, because it is national land, um, there isn't um, an opportunity um, to have um, any approval, but it certainly um, contains elements that we would consider would be important to protect. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Minister. Is EPSDD actively working on any feedback on this development at the moment? And if so, what are they working on? Ms Pazzarotti. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, for the question. Um, so, um, as noted, um, because it will go through an approval process through the EPBC Act, um, we, ex we, we know that um, the, the, the relevant government department, the Commonwealth Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, will be um, contacting EPSDD for comment. Um, we don't have access to using a bilater bilateral agreement because it is on national land, um, but we certainly have been engaging in terms of understanding what's on the site and we'll be very active in that approval process in terms of providing information. <coughs> Questions without notice, Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Women. Minister, what is the ACT government doing to prevent and respond to sexual harassment in our workplaces and across the country? Ms Kearney. Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for her question. Of course, the ACT government is making great progress against its commitments to prevent and respond to sexual harassment across the ACT community. Uh, members will recall that in June I announced the chair of the overarching steering committee for sexual assault prevention and response program, Renee Leon, who is an experienced CEO with over 15 years in senior roles, including as departmental secretary in the Australian Public Service. In her role as the chair, Ms Leon will work with the steering committee representatives and the working groups and reference groups in this program to drive prevention responses to sexual harassment and assault in the ACT and advise on key priorities for action by the government. Led by the sector, this work will be inclusive and intersectional about experiences from across the community, including from people with disability, children and young people, the LGBTIQ plus community, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and communities that are culturally and linguistically diverse. A reference group has been set up focusing specifically on sexual harassment and assault in the workplace and this group will provide input to all the working groups to represent the perspectives of workers and workplace safety. Uh, within the working groups and reference groups, a steering committee chair will now be moving forward uh, as those uh, meetings have occurred within all those working groups. And I know members in this place, um, the Leader of the Opposition, Ms Lee and Dr Patterson, have already presented to those uh, to the law reform working groups, and I know that there are more presentations to come along. As well, the ACT government has set up in the, our own workplace here in the Legislative Assembly, the Parliamentary Women's Group, the Government Women's Caucus, as well as a support network for staff. So I'm confident, Madam Speaker, that the ACT government is well positioned to deliver an evidence-based approach to sexual assault that places victim survivors at the front. Dr Patterson, supplementary. Thank you. Um, Minister, how is sexual harassment a gendered issue? Ms Berry. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I thank Dr Patterson for the supplementary. Um, this week, um, I, uh, yesterday, in fact, I tabled the ACT government's response to the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. The ACT government's response provides a position on each of the 55 recommendations in the Respect at Work report. The ACT government acknowledges that gendered power imbalances in the workplace and across society are key drivers of sexual harassment and that other forms of discrimination, disadvantage and harassment intersect to compound the impact of sexual harassment, such as sexuality, cultural background and disability. 
These gendered power imbalances go to the root of mainstream and harmful understandings of gender, the way we misunderstand gender as a binary with set roles and ways of behaving. I can say anecdotally that psychosocial hazards such as sexual harassment are more prevalent in traditionally female industries such as nursing, education and hospitality. And these hazards lead to risks which can result in long-lasting psychological injuries. These types of injuries present a workplace safety issue, yet they can be more hidden and can develop over time. They can also go untreated and unacknowledged, and this presents another workplace gender act, the uh, gender gap. The ACT government is committed to continuing primary prevention work, uh, doing that work across our ACT public schools, as well as importantly across the community to challenge harmful gender norms and prevent and respond to sexual harassment. Ms. Hall. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, what would the ACT propose should be implemented across the country to address gendered violence? Ms. Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms. Orr for the supplementary question. Well, everyone has the right to feel safe, safe in the community, safe at home and safe at work. And the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report demonstrates that far too many people, for far too many people this is not the case. 39% of women, 26% of men have all experienced sexual uh, harassment at work in the last five years. This reality stems from gender inequality and unequal power structures where employers fall short by not holding perpetrators and harassers to account. Workplace sexual harassment warrants a national response, and the ACT government encourages action by the Commonwealth to protect workers and to take steps to advance women's safety and gender equality. The Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021 responds to some, but not all, of the recommendations from the Respect at Work report. And the ACT government is encouraging the Commonwealth to reconsider its position with regard to delaying broader amendments to the fair work system. To delay the introduction of counterpart amendments to, the explicit, to explicitly prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act limits our ability to clearly demonstrate our rejection of discrimination in any form. As a government committed to upholding the rights and entitlements and protections of workers, I want to acknowledge the work of Minister Gentleman in this space. It's our position that the Commonwealth should be taking advantage of the opportunities provided by the Bill to ensure that sexual harassment and discrimination on the grounds of sex are expressly <coughs> prohibited under the Fair Work Act. To, the, to do this, we would need to provide the strongest evidence possible to the federal government to ensure that they can do this work. Questions without notice, Mrs. Cooper. Supplementary. Oh, yes, new question. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, when you incorrectly told the Canberra public that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 km per hour speed limit in the new speed restrictions area in Civic, did anyone from your office or directorate advise you of this error? Mr. Baum. And there was actually no question to me there, but I'll take it that the question was, it wasn't asked, but nevertheless, uh, no, Madam Speaker. Mrs. Cookin. Chief Minister, why did your office or directorate fail to alert you to this error, and why does it take questioning from the opposition to bring the truth to light? Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't know that this would be the top issue that we've been dealing with at the moment, frankly, uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, with massive implications, a lot of other issues uh, on my desk at the moment. I apologise. You're telling the truth, uh, Mr. Hanson, enough. I apologise for the error. There was a, a lot of warnings given, but it would appear not individual warnings to individual motorists by way of letter. I apologise if there is any misunderstanding in relation to that matter. What is, but what is very clear, Madam Speaker, is that there were months and months of warnings, signs, media coverage, social media commentary, debate in the community about the initiative in, a, in its uh, substance. Uh, I apologise. Right at the moment, I had a lot of things on my plate, not least of which is leading this territory's response to a global pandemic. So I apologise for getting it wrong on this issue. But right now, of all the things that we face, 
This is not in the top ten, Madam Speaker. Well, if your colleagues were quiet, I'd give you. Sure, everybody. <laughs> Ms. Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, minister or Chief Minister or the Minister, how much was spent on all the new and variable signage, the public information campaign, and how does this compare to the cost of sending out warning letters? Mr Barr. Uh, I'll take that on notice. Questions without notice. Ms Castley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. On June the 22nd, you gave a ministerial statement, and I quote, our actions have meant the ACT continues to be one of Australia's strongest economies with the strongest labour market in the country. Unemployment was 3.6 per cent, which you said was significantly below the Territory's decade average, and I quote, the lowest in the country by a long way. Just one month later, on July the 26th, the Canberra Times ran a story with the headlines that ACT job market is the weakest in the nation with the quarterly ComSec report revealing unemployment had climbed to 4.9 per cent. AC Tre Treasury said that 5,900 Canberrans had lost their jobs. Chief Minister and Treasurer, why have 5,900 Canberrans lost their jobs in the last month under your watch? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The monthly unemployment data is subject to considerable uh, variation. It's a very small sample size and it is often uh, backcast and adjusted. Uh, a movement of that size is unprecedented. Uh, we looked uh, at other sources of data, including the uh, single touch payroll data, that indicates that there was a decline in employment, but not to the extent registered in that single month's figure. So uh, we are looking, uh, obviously, at uh, the situation. Uh, the unemployment rate in the ACT, according to that month, one single month snapshot, is the same as the Australian unemployment rate. So whilst the CBA commentary would in fact reflect uh, the fact that normally uh, unemployment in the ACT is lower than the national average, there's this one rogue figure. We'll need more data to confirm if that is actually the case, and I suspect there may be a downward revision, but I don't know yet. And so when we get the next set of unemployment data, which is due in a couple of weeks, we'll have a better sense of whether this is a one-off anomaly or in fact a developing trend. Uh, if it is a developing trend, then the government will seek to respond by creating more jobs, including in our budget in August. Supplementary. So how will these 5,900 unemployed Canberrans be able to find work given the unemployment rate is well above the decade average? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Well, several weeks ago, before the Sydney lockdown commenced, the biggest single complaint from most industry sectors in the ACT was an inability to find workers. Uh, this remains the case for nearly all industry sectors within the ACT economy, except for those that are tourism exposed, because clearly with the lockdown in Sydney, the Victorian lockdown and the Queensland lockdown, our tourism industry has lost about 85 per cent of its market. So it doesn't, it's not experiencing a supply side shock. All of the businesses are able to trade with no restrictions. It's experiencing a demand side shock as a result uh, of pandemic-induced uh, lockdowns in the three biggest Australian states. So the issue from here, Madam Speaker, will be uh, whether our local economy, given Canberrans can't really travel many places, we will see a, a local spend pick up. And the June retail trade figures are encouraging in that regard. And for hospitality, for example, in June, it was the third highest spend ever in the history of that data set, coming from May, which was the highest ever spend in the history of that data set. Uh, so it is showing that Canberrans will spend their money locally when they can't travel overseas or interstate. Dr Patterson. Speaker. Um, Chief Minister, in addressing the unemployment rate, what is the ACT government doing to create more jobs? Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, obviously, we are the second largest employer in the city ourselves, uh, and so we have taken on the responsibility of promoting employment growth and secure local jobs 
uh, through a range of initiatives uh, that the government undertakes, as well as support uh, of key uh, industry sectors uh, that are large employers. Uh, so we will continue that focus uh, as we project beyond the immediate lockdowns uh, uh, along the eastern seaboard of Australia. Uh, we would anticipate the sort of economic rebound that we saw after a similar wave of lockdowns in 2020. Uh, the evidence appears to be that short, sharp lockdowns uh, have the least economic cost and then we will see a rebound. Now, we hope the short, sharp lockdowns that have worked in Victoria will work in Queensland. Uh, it is now obviously too late for a short, sharp lockdown in New South Wales and so they are in for several more months, it would seem, uh, of lockdown and restrictions. We are factoring that in uh, to our economic thinking given Sydney uh, and the Greater Sydney region represents about 20% of the national economy. Questions without notice, Mr Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. The repeated lesson from COVID is the need to communicate effectively with all parts of the community, in particular those for whom English is not their first language. In what languages has ACT Health produced materials to provide information about COVID? Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Braddock for the question. I'll take the detail of the question on notice. I can advise Mr Braddock that the COVID-19 website has available uh, materials available in 15 languages, but I don't have the list of those languages um, on me. It's probably actually available on the COVID-19 website, which, of the, which those languages actually are. Um, the Public Information Coordination Centre for COVID-19, which has been running for some time now, takes very seriously uh, the importance of uh, communicating with culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT. And in fact, a liaison officer from the Community Services Directorate works with the PIC to help identify opportunities to communicate with cold communities. And I know that's really been appreciated over time. COVID-19 media statements are all that detail, uh, detailing key changes in travel and restrictions are also provided in audio format to two Canberra community radio stations and these stations collectively broadcast in more than 20 languages um, spoken in the ACT. Public health advice is also provided through proactive interviews and community radio in response to particular issues and circumstances, for example, for example the celebration of Eid while remaining COVID safe and tips on how to, apply, how to comply with public health directions like completing uh, declaration forms. The COVID-19 media statement is also provided to the Right Act Chinese edition team to disseminate information to approximately 8,000 Canberrans who read Chinese. And from this month, Facebook campaign advertising will include a language translation option, which allows both the user and moderator to see the content in a number of languages. Uh, officials are also looking at how this can be applied to broader communication activities. Mr. What is the vaccination rate for culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT? Ms. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll take the detail of that question on notice. I am not sure that we're going to be able to provide a specific figure um, for Mr. Braddock in relation to that. I just don't know that our data will capture all, uh, the, all, all the culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT. Um, but if there's specific information that Mr. Braddock um, is after, he, he can always ask our office and we'll do our best to try to get um, that specific information to him. Um, but we do know in terms of vaccination, again, as per the broader public communications around COVID-19, that engagement with culturally and linguistically diverse communities has been a key priority. Um, and we're seeing that right across the community. Indeed, it's recognised as one of the challenges in uh, the vaccination of the aged care workforce, for which, of course, the Commonwealth has primary responsibility, uh, that overcoming vaccine hesitancy and ensuring that people um, in those frontline workforces are able to come forward and confident to come forward and get vaccinated is about addressing insecure work and the consequences of potentially having um, an, an adverse reaction to a vaccine, a short-lived reaction um, that will mean needing to take a day off work and people being uh, remunerated for that, but also ensuring that people um, can hear uh, from people that they trust, their community leaders and people who speak their language about that. And that's something we've been working very closely with the Commonwealth and their providers um, to ensure is happening uh, in that um, aged care workforce. 
More broadly, paid community uh, radio ads have been running in 10 languages and social media ads have been targeting both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and cultural and, and linguistically diverse communities. Radio scripts are provided to the Canberra Multicultural Community Forum to read out in different languages through their community radio shows uh, and resources are available on the COVID-19 website, as I said, in multiple languages. Uh, and we really work closely with community leaders as well. <laughs> Ms Clay, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What's the vaccination rate for First Nations peoples in the OCG? Ms Stephen-Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and again, that, that data is actually available in our weekly um, vaccination update, but I don't have that with me at the moment. So I'll take the question on notice um, and come back to the chamber, but I'll be able to provide that information uh, potentially um, directly after this. Um, it is The vaccination rate is lower for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community than it is for the rest of the community. And uh, we've been working uh, with that community. Obviously, Wenunga Nimitja is um, a vaccination centre and they can provide uh, both AstraZeneca and now Pfizer vaccines as well and have been doing a great job in reaching out to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community um, to get vaccinated. I can say the vaccination rate in the older age group for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is high. So those over 65, it is actually uh, very high. Uh, but for those in younger age groups and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are eligible down to the age of 16 and from next Monday will be eligible down to the age of 12, uh, the vaccination rate is not as high uh, as it is for the wider community. So obviously um, we will continue to work uh, with Winunga, we will continue to hold community engagement sessions and I can advise that ACT Health has um, had face-to-face -face sessions uh, throughout the COVID-19 response, so not necessarily specifically in relation to vaccination, with the Across Galunga program, with Guggen Gulwan, uh, and with Yerung Mura Good Pathways, um, as, well as, and, uh, as well as working very closely with Winunga to try and increase vaccine take up in that community. Questions without notice, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Business. In June, the Canberra Business Chamber revealed Canberra has the lowest long-term business survival rate in the country, with only 62.5% of ACT businesses trading after five years, compared to more than 65% nationally. Minister, this surely challenges the government's goal of reaching 250,000 jobs in Canberra by 2025. Minister, why are more businesses failing in the ACT compared with the rest of the country? Mr. Barr. I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, the government uh, is aware uh, that, that is, uh, there is a minor statistical difference between the national average and the ACT average. Uh, that is uh, less than three percentage points, given the, uh, the total number of businesses uh, we're talking about. It uh, really uh, comes down to dozens uh, in, in actual reality in terms of the, the number of businesses. I do note uh, Mr Cain uh, excluded from his question, and in fact we also have the fastest number of, or we have the most number of new businesses. Now every, uh, every month uh, we get an update on business entries and exits in the ACT, and I can advise the Assembly that in every single month there are more business entries than there are business exits. So the number of businesses in the Territory continues to grow month on month. Uh, questions are in relation to uh, the detail of why certain businesses survive and others don't uh, is the subject uh, of some uh, discussion and debate, uh, and there is some national research I understand in, into this matter. Uh, a little bit will depend, of course, uh, on the nature of the business as to whether it's a uh, sole trader, for example. Uh, there's, there is a, a degree of, uh, a higher degree of uh, sole trader and micro businesses in the ACT where people register an ABN uh, to undertake some additional uh, income earning activity that's secondary to their main job. Uh, that is one factor uh, that is uh, clearly the case in terms of both entries and exits in the ACT that appears to be somewhat different uh, from other parts of Australia. Uh, but the statistical difference between the ACT and the national average is not so great as to suggest uh, that there is a massive gulf uh, between what happens here uh, and what happens elsewhere in Australia. Mr Kane, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how many of the new jobs required for us to reach the target of 250,000 will be created directly 
or indirectly by Commonwealth government spending. Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, the Commonwealth accounts for one in four jobs in our economy at the moment uh, in terms of direct employment. If you then extrapolate uh, Commonwealth funding, for example, to public institutions like the universities, uh, then that would see uh, the level of Commonwealth uh, generated job activity uh, increase uh, closer uh, towards perhaps one half uh, of all employment. Uh, that would be higher in the ACT clearly than, uh, than any other economy uh, in Australia. But uh, I guess it depends, Mr Kane, on how far you extend the reach uh, of you know, Commonwealth uh, created uh, because yeah, well, they, they put money in. I mean, the government uh, and governments uh, at federal and state and territory level are obviously significant employers in and of themselves, uh, and the amount of money that is churned through the economy uh, by governments to support other industries. I mean, for example, just in recent days, the Commonwealth uh, has put you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars further into the aviation industry, for example, to. Uh, to protect employment. Now, we could have a philosophical debate about uh, whether jobs in the aviation industry are Commonwealth supported or not. Uh, you know, to some extent they are, and they certainly have been extensively uh, during the pandemic. Questions supplementary, Ms Kessley? Financial support to help businesses survive. Mr Barr. Well, our government is providing direct financial support uh, to help businesses survive in a, in a number of different ways, uh, Madam Speaker, across a number of different industry sectors, uh, uh, from uh, grants to support uh, business activity uh, in the export field, uh, from grants to support business uh, activity uh, in the domestic market, tourism uh, and otherwise, Madam Speaker, uh, we continue to support a variety of different industry sectors. Uh, almost every part of the ACT economy has a degree of public subsidy one way or the other. I mean, this, this city would not exist without government. This economy is artificial to the extent that it would not have generated $41 billion of activity if there wasn't government intervention, government support and a deliberate decision more than a century ago uh, to have an administrative capital uh, that was wholly contained within New South Wales uh, but a certain distance from Sydney. Uh, Canberra would not, uh, you know, this economy would not exist without those decisions. So uh, almost everything that happens in Canberra uh, clearly has a degree of government influence, be that federal uh, or territory. Although over time, as the population has increased uh, and the economy has diversified, there is more activity uh, that might be sustainable outside uh, of the public sector ecosystem that is uh, the basis reason for being for the City of Canberra. Questions without notice? Ms Hall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning and Land Management. Minister, what is the significance of World Ranger Day? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ms Orr for her question and, of course, her interest in the management of ACT parks and reserves. Last Saturday was the 31st of July, was World Ranger Day. As the name suggests, this occasion is celebrated around the world. It provides a chance to reflect and thank those whose job it is to care for the environment that we live in. It's also time for acknowledging rangers around the world who sometimes face life-threatening situations and to commemorate those who have died in the line of duty. It is a day to recognise those who stand up to protect wildlife and ecosystems, sometimes on the front line of conservation. This may include active protection from poachers and illegal logging. Although it seems like an amazing job, and it can be, Madam Speaker, it can also be dangerous. Here in the ACT, our rangers deal with dangers including venomous snakes, rescuing lost hikers and battling bushfires. World Ranger Day is a time to pause and reflect on those working around the world who are killed or injured at work, but it's also a time to celebrate the wonderful work of our rangers and dedicated staff who love their jobs and love our bush capital. Ms Hall, supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister, how are parks and conservation staff protecting our bush capital? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As you and I know from our many years in this place, our rangers in the ACT are extremely dedicated to their jobs. 
They've worked especially hard over the past year to give Canberrans more opportunities to enjoy our parks and reserves. During COVID restrictions, the ACT's parks and reserves have been more valuable to ever uh, for Canberrans. Our rangers have worked tirelessly to maintain and improve them, including carrying out substantial repairs from bushfire damage. These efforts meant Namaji National Park was able to reopen to visitors earlier than expected. And they've worked hard to prepare for the upcoming bushfire season to help Your protect our parks and the native. Yeah, I, yeah, it didn't seem to go that. Um, members, are we, given that there was clearly a problem with the clock, can we give a few more seconds to the minister? Thank you. Speaker, they have worked very hard uh, to protect our native wildlife, including within a Mulligan's Flat and Tidbin Villa Sanctuaries uh, and at the new grassland Eelis Dragon Breeding Facility. They've also done great work, Madam Speaker, in planning for the future of our bush capital by developing management plans, carrying out strategic operations and taking great care in conservation practices. So I want to thank everyone in the ACT Parks and Conservation Service for that important work. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what other ways is the ACT government caring for our parks and reserves? Mr Gentleman. And I thank Mr Pedersen for his question too. The government has supported volunteer groups for a number of years, and I'm proud to have been involved in delivering funding and support for these groups. They do excellent work across the many parks and reserves in the ACT as land managers and custodians. Volunteers have been involved, along with parks and conservation staff, in bushfire recovery in Namaji National Park. Uh, they also work on weed management, seasonal restoration, as well as planting and cleanups. Their support for the work of Parks and Conservation Service, of course, is invaluable. And I'm extremely pleased that the groups will have continued funding from the ACT government for the next four years. This support from the government is a reflection of the hard work and dedication of those volunteers. And our volunteers work uh, closely with our rangers to care for the unique environment in the ACT. They share a passion and a dedication to conservation in our bush capital and the love of the outdoors. Canberrans love our bush capital, Madam Speaker, and I encourage all of those who are interested in conservation to get involved in our local land management groups. Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Further questions can be placed on the notice page. Thank you, Mr Barr. Matters arising from question time, Mr Barr. Thank you, Mr Barr. asked me a question uh, in relation to uh, comments on Chief Minister Talkback. I, uh, the one point I neglected to, uh, to raise in my response uh, to him was that I understand that uh, so there was a grace period between when the cameras uh, were active and then when enforcement commenced. The speed limit changed in March, I understand, uh, and enforcement didn't begin until July. Was a period in between, clearly where um, uh, where there were, were no fines issued. I have, I have confused that uh, and thought that warnings were issued rather than no fines. I again apologise uh, for that confusion. Other matters arising from question time, Ms. Chain. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I was asked about the uh, discrepancy in the communications uh, spend for Choose CBR. Uh, the opposition is. Uh, conflating two different briefs, um, so essentially not comparing apples with apples. Uh, $230,000 was the total allocation uh, for marketing, communications and administration costs. Uh, the $150,000 figure that they used uh, includes GST. Um, $140,000 was the campaign allocation. Uh, so um, what they're drawing uh, that figure from is the brief about the campaign uh, allocation uh, and me approving it. Uh, going to the independent reviewer, which is standard practice for campaigns, uh, over $40,000. Other matters arising, Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mr Braddock asked which languages translated resources were available in. Uh, the COVID-19 ACT government resources are available on the web page. Uh, I think I said in 15 languages that includes English, so the other 14 languages are Arabic, Chinese, simplified, Chinese, traditional, Dari, Farsi, Filipino, Greek, Hindi, Korean, Spanish, Tamil, Thai, Urdu, and Vietnamese. And those information, uh, that information can be found at www.covid19.act.gov.au 
slash community slash translated hyphen resources. Uh, and also on that page, um, there are links to AC Australian government resources uh, that have been translated, and there are also links to SBS resources, and their multi multilingual portal um, has information available in 63 languages. Uh, Ms Clay also asked about vaccination rates uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Uh, I can advise the Assembly that as at the 28th of July, which is the latest figures that I have available to me, 94% uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Canberrans aged 60 and above had had a first dose and 48% a second dose, so comparing that to the broader ACT residents, that compares to 85% and 35%. So as I said, for older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, the rates are high. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 16 to 59, 28% uh, have had a first dose and 15% are fully vaccinated. That compares with a wider the all ACT residents numbers of 36% and 18%, so uh, slightly lower. That may reflect the fact that um, Wananga didn't get access to the Pfizer um, vaccinations early in the program. They do now have access to Pfizer and so um, I, I think we can expect to see that they will be promoting that access to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under the age of 60 years. Other matters arising? We'll move to papers. For the information of members, I present a copy of correspondence from noon of this year concerning the International Treaty on Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation. And with that, we'll move to private members' business and I'll call the clerk. Private members' business, notice number one. Ms Cassidy. Standing in my name on the notice paper relating to hospitality support package and the nighttime economy. Question is that the motion be agreed, Ms Cassidy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Canberra's hospitality sector is in dire financial straits. Our unemployment situation is also of enormous concern. The situation is bleak and the future looks bleaker. In the late June sitting week in this chamber, the Chief Minister was boasting uh, Canberra's unemployment rate of 3.6 per cent, and I quote, the lowest in the country by a long way. Seven weeks on, we are far from that. That is why I'm here today to introduce a notice of motion calling on the Labor Greens government to urgently introduce a hospitality support package for a sector that has suffered greatly due to severe lockdowns across the country, particularly in New South Wales, and they're crying out for support. Mr. Assistant Speaker, as we change the guards, on July the 26th, the Canberra Times carried a headline declaring that ACT's job market is the weakest in the nation, referring to the new ComSec report. The unemployment, ra unemployment rate surged to 4.9% in June. And we now have the weakest jobs market in the nation. We know that Canberra's winter is always a difficult time for our hospitality sector. Our restaurants, bars and cafes, you know, we tend to rug up and stay indoors and business cops the downturn. But that loss of patronage is nothing compared to the thumping that business have taken due to severe lockdowns across the country, but particularly in Sydney and much of New South Wales. The situation is ever-changing and harsher measures continue to be imposed. Now is the time for the government to act. The hospitality sector needs a survival plan before more businesses go broke and more jobs are lost. On top of the severe restrictions across the border hitting our economy hard, Canberra's own period of mandatory mask wearing also took a toll on hospitality venues. It caused anxiety with the effect that some Canberrans put a break on plans to venture out and enjoy a drink and a meal. The reality is that some of Canberra's hospitality venues have closed and others are contemplating closure and most have suffered a severe hit on takings. We know of the job losses, reduced hours and worry and I fear that there is worse to come. That is why I'm calling on the government to immediately implement a hospitality support package which includes emergency cash grants for hospitality businesses and a range of other measures to help venues stay afloat. 
Minister Assistant Speaker, it is one thing to read statistics and articles about business downturns and job losses, but it's far more disturbing and compelling to learn people's stories which reveal such pain and struggle. Last week, I spoke to a Kingston business owner who had suffered a 30% drop in business since early June. He believes the threat of restrictions in Canberra and mandatory mask wearing scared a lot of people to be cautious about their spending. He went on, I have let staff go and cut my casual hours significantly. When you let a full-time staff member go and have to pay out leave entitlements, so have leave entitlements building up, tax obligations building up, it's going to be a shock down the track, he said. In three to six months from now, businesses are going to close. It's something I have to consider. Do I continue to run the business in an insolvent fashion because I cannot reduce fixed costs? But running insolvent, you're putting those staff entitlements at risk and then you have super to consider. We are in a precarious situation. A lot of businesses think it will be short term and they can trade through it. But for me, it's about how much more you can comfortably take on board before you say enough is enough. I've been in business over 30 years and I've always paid my bills and staff wages and I don't want to be put in that situation. It's a sad story. A bar owner in Belconnen has laid off five staff members and now runs his business solely with his family. His monthly turnover has halved from 30,000 to 15,000 while his rent is 5,000 and operating costs are 10,000. He said, we have a month to month lease and if things don't improve, we are going to close. The business owner said his electricity alone is 800 to $1,000 a month and he called on the government to provide financial support for overheads as well as survival plan for the next three years. Recently, the owner of Parlour in New Acton wrote to the Chief Minister asking for support for the restaurant and function industry. Our Parlour employs 22 permanent staff, Dr Ross Sidney wrote, and he went on, as a direct result of the uncertainties caused by the pandemic in New South Wales, to date we have had $40,000 worth of forward function bookings cancelled for the period from mid-July to the end of August. Dr Sidney said the New South Wales lockdown extension until the end of August would mean more cancellations into October. Overall, compared to the same period in July 2019, before the pandemic, he wrote, Parler's July 2021 turnover has declined more than 20%. Mr Assistant Speaker, we know what a boost it is to Canberra's tourism and hospitality sector when the federal parliament comes to town. Canberra is full of MPs, senators and staffers, not to mention an army of lobbyists who flock to our restaurants and bars. This is a lucrative time for our many hospitality venues who rely on the poly trade. It doesn't help to have the ACT Health Minister in the media last week warning politicians in Canberra for federal sittings this week to avoid pubs and clubs. Let me be clear, I understand completely the real health challenges that we all face and the community needs to fight this pandemic and be safe. However, actions have consequences and the government needs to understand that if it makes rulings or requests urging people to stay away from our hospitality venues, our businesses actually feel that loss in a very real way and the government should acknowledge that impact and respond with financial and other support. Just two days ago, the Canberra Times splashed the headline that Parliament rules a big hit to business. A big hit to business. This is what concerns the Canberra Liberals. Almost 65,000 Canberrans are employed in small business, including tens of thousands in our hospitality sector, and many are being hit hard. The article says that Canberra businesses fear being crippled by the COVID-restricted parliamentary sitting period. What the article failed to mention is that many hospitality venues are already there. They're already crippled. The Australian Hotels Association reported that the situation for hotels is dire, and we know that. This is why the government last month announced the hotel and tourism operators could claim up to $75,000 in rebates, which Chief Minister Barr said should help about 90% of providers and 20 privately owned tourism venues. 
But Mr Assistant Speaker, accommodation, tourism and hospitality, they work hand in hand. So it beggars belief that the government can unveil a support package for tourism and accommodation while ignoring our hospitality venues. Just yesterday, the Australian newspaper had an article in which Homelessness Australia has said, family small business owners who had lost their livelihoods in the pandemic were a growing group of people seeking homelessness services. Mr Assistant Speaker, I have been in business and I know that smart businesses save for a rainy day. But this one has been the longest rainy day that we have seen. It is too tough, a business owner said to me last week. We are hitting an emotional wall. I know firsthand what it is like. You feel like you're drowning, like there is an elephant who has just taken up residence on your chest. And the thing we have to remember here is that these hospitality businesses, it's not out of mismanagement or stupidity. This pandemic is thrust upon them. They're doing well to stay afloat. We know that the Choose CBR trial and the scheme wasted taxpayers' money. Less than 20% of eligible businesses participated. The system crashed. We've heard it all. The government is yet to reveal the full extent of the questionable transactions. The Labor Greens government needs a plan for business. In this case, today, the hospitality sector, because that is what business needs. A government that understands them, supports them and delivers a plan that will genuinely help businesses to get through the tough times ahead. That is why the Canberra Liberals are calling on the government to immediately implement a hospitality support package to show the sector that government has their back, which is something we all question, as well as emergency cash grants, money straight into the bank accounts of our hospitality venues to put towards the operating costs, like power bills, rent, supplier bills. The Canberra Liberals are also calling for extending the waiver for outdoor dining permit fees until the end of 2022 extending the scheme to allow pubs, bars and restaurants to sell takeaway alcohol until at least the end of this year, waiving food business registration fees until the end of 2022, allowing business a full rebate on water and sewage fixed to charge components of their Icon water bills in line with the government's tourism support measures, and working with hospitality businesses on other support measures as the pandemic and restrictions continue. Mr Assistant Speaker, the Labor Greens government should do what it has been elected to do, provide support to our hard-working hospitality venues, our restaurants, cafes and bars, and genuinely give them a helping hand at a critical time of need. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Ms Chain. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I move the amendment circulated in my name. The question now is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, the government has moved quickly to provide targeted support where it's needed and when it's needed. In doing so, we work closely with industry, we pay close attention to market and economic factors, and we respond where it is needed. Indeed, the bulk of what Ms Cassley has called for are things that we have done or are already doing, and it's pleasing to know she thinks they are good ideas. Examples of these initiatives include allowing on-licence venues to sell takeaway alcohol, waiving food, bu food business registration fees and waiving fees for outdoor dining permits. These were implemented quickly last year, but we have made further announcements, including in the February budget. Food businesses which have prepaid their licence automatically had it extended for an additional 12 months until end March 2022. General licensees received an additional 12-month waiver until the end of June 2022. Initially, last year, from 25 March until 24 March this year, commercial liquor permits were issued to on-licensees with the application fee waived, which allowed for the takeaway sales and home delivery of liquor. In response to the Sydney lockdown and a bitterly cold winter here, at the beginning of July this year, we reintroduced that on liquor licensees would be able to sell takeaway alcohol and to offer it for home delivery. 
to make it as easy as possible for businesses. Permits were issued automatically for those that had taken up the same opportunity in 2020. Businesses that did not take up this opportunity last year and would now like to were advised how they could contact Access Canberra to request it. When we announced this in July, initially we offered this for one month, but having continued to monitor this situation, we have extended it for another month until the end of August. Late last week, all current on-licence holders who had a permit to sell takeaway alcohol were emailed noting the extension until the end of August. And earlier this week, all other on-licence holders were emailed who have not yet taken up the initiative to again highlight the takeaway opportunity is available to them. And if there are businesses still interested, they should contact the Access Canberra Liquor Licensing Team. This is easy via email at aclicker at act.gov.au or by calling 6207 2343. And I give my assurance that this will be turned around very quickly. And I absolutely support what the Minister for Health and indeed the National Chief Medical Officer has said about federal parliamentarians not going out and about for all of the reasons that have been canvassed. But there is nothing stopping them engaging with businesses by ordering in, and we absolutely encourage them to do that while they are here. There are other initiatives too which have been encouraging Canberrans, who can, to get out and about and providing them with entertainment options like Amp it Up, an important stimulus to the broader sector, but one intrinsically tied to the nighttime economy and to the hospitality sector. So, as a government, we have been consistently employing the levers to encourage Canberrans to support local and to provide support to businesses. And then the levers to encourage Canberrans to spend local, providing incentives to get out and about, but also recognising that if Canberrans do have some hesitancy with that, or simply can't, then employing other measures, like the off-licence permits, so that they can still support local. We will continue to engage with industry stakeholders on what they need, and we will continue to be responsive to conditions. And it's for this reason that we have removed the dates Ms Cassley included in her motion for how long initiatives should be in place. This is firstly because several of these are already in place and because the dates she's included appear not to be based on any industry data or forecasts, so they are nothing more than arbitrary. We need to be responsive and that's what this amendment allows for. What Ms Cassley's motion touches on is that when any major area goes into extended lockdown, like Sydney has, this does have broad impacts on the entire national economy that are out of our immediate control. What that means is that when Sydney locks down, it's not just Sydney that's affected. It means that the largest domestic pool of tourists are not travelling. This has obvious impacts. It has always been the federal government's role to provide the bulk of financial support across Australia for employers and employees suffering hardship due to the pandemic. It took them a while, but we have seen the federal government finally start to step up to that effect in Sydney and some regional areas. But they need to acknowledge that millions of residents locked down for months is affecting tourism and thus accommodation and some hospitality providers right across the country and including the ACT. The amendment reflects that fact. The Chief Minister has written to the Commonwealth Treasurer to urge the Federal Government to do its bit, and I'm sure the Chief Minister will talk about it in more detail. The Federal Government should be developing a nationally consistent approach where the COVID-19 disaster payment is extended to eligible employers and employees who have been affected by a lockdown in another jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, it is pleasing to see the Canberra Liberals make such a clear statement on their belief in the role of government Surprising, perhaps, but welcome. The role of the ACT government is to use the levers we have available to us to provide effective and targeted support. We have done that and we will continue to do that. Engaging with industry and within the reality in which decisions on support measures are made. As a government, we have and will continue to work with industry stakeholders to tailor measures that are appropriate, proportionate, targeted and reduce the administrative burden on businesses. One of the many reasons why automatic fee waivers and automatic extensions are such a great tool. But the federal government must realise it has a role in this and respond appropriately. And we look forward to the Commonwealth Treasurer's response to the Chief Minister's letter. 
So I trust as an Assembly that we are united on the Federal Government's role, and I commend my amendment to the Assembly. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Mr Assistant Speaker. I rise to speak to the impact of COVID-19 on Canberra's business and tourism sector. The ACT Greens will support the amendments from Minister Chain to the motion from Ms Cassley. I would like to thank Ms Cassley for her motion and giving me yet another opportunity to rise in this House and profess the ACT Greens strong support for Canberra's small, medium and family sized businesses. As a previous small business owner and small business employee throughout my pre-parliamentary career, I feel deeply for those who've lost their jobs and those who have experienced a downturn in trade over the last 18 months since the beginning of the pandemic. I commend the ACT government and particularly the Minister for Business and the Treasurer for their swift, innovative and strategic work to ensure the ACT's unemployment rates remain low and our retail turns over, turnovers remain strong. This is especially worthy of praise considering the significant and sometimes abrupt changes to trade that our businesses have experienced both from our lockdown last year and the impact of other jurisdictions having to continue to lock down. The amendments we are supporting today strengthen Ms Carsley's motion by providing the government with the flexibility it needs to appropriately respond to the economic challenges that lie ahead. Importantly, by supporting these amendments, the ACT Greens are amplifying the call from the Chief Minister to the Federal Government to design their disaster relief packages around business turnover, not just geographical location. As Ms Cassley's original motion rightly points out, while we have, with a fair bit of luck and a lot of good planning, I dare say, avoided a lockdown here, some of our local businesses, particularly those that provide accommodation to overnight visitors, have seen a downturn in, mo uh, in a situation most likely to those uh, lockdowns in New South Wales. Recently, Mr Assistant Speaker, I've met with several important stakeholders in our small business and tourism sectors, including the Canberra Innovation Network and the Canberra Tourism Forum. These organisations have discussed with me the impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak in New South Wales on the ACT economy and on their operations. Prior to COVID-19, residents from New South Wales made up between 60 to 70 per cent of Canberra's domestic visitors, with four million of our closest neighbours coming to the ACT every year to stay in our hotels, visit our national and local attractions and eat at our unrivalled local produce. At the height of the pandemic in June last year, the percentage of visitors coming from New South Wales rose, evidencing the significant contribution that they have continued to make to our economy even during a pandemic. While we are not locked down, we benefit from the trade of those who are, and therefore we are impacted by these people being in lockdown. A more nuanced, comprehensive approach is needed uh, to respond to this appropriately and sufficiently, as this, is a, as this is a responsibility that should be led by the federal government. The ACT Greens will be supporting these amendments that reflect evidence obtained through the Australian Bureau of Statistics monthly retail trade data from May and the work of government to support the hospitality sector. Today, the ABS released their latest updates to this data for June. We were pleased to see in the jurisdiction by jurisdiction comparison, the ACT is performing the strongest of our counterparts with a 1.3% upturn in retail trade from May to June. While at the big picture, this data is telling a very promising story about our economic recovery to date, this data is important in assisting the government to develop and target specific supports to those parts of the local hospitality industry that have been most affected. There is no denying that some businesses in Canberra continue to do it tough. The amendments we're supporting today allow the government to undertake this analysis and ensure that our responses are targeted and strategic, rather than an unmeasured cash splash suggested by the Canberra Liberals that would see some businesses that have done quite well in recent months receive the same amount of support from those who are struggling. It is worth noting that some businesses in Canberra, particularly those in the dining and takeaway sector, have done very well thanks in part to the government's measured and appropriate response to date and to the support of the local Canberra community who have chosen to spend their money locally instead of taking their money up the road to Sydney. Our food, and, our food businesses have seen an upturn in trade in both May and June. I'm pleased to say that I played my part in my own electorate, Mr Assistant Speaker. Uh, I have many friends in Sydney and I feel for them right now as they're experiencing yet another lockdown. A few months ago, when things in Sydney still seemed manageable, I had intended to travel away from the lofty heights of Tuggeranong to Sydney to see those friends. But as is the nature of this pandemic, the situation changed quickly and my plans were cancelled. My team in my office and I took the opportunity to enjoy a meal at Street of Asia, followed by a night of zone bowling in Tuggeranong. 
Uh, anecdotally, I know many Canberrans who've chosen to spend their money in local businesses and entertainment venues instead of travelling interstate. Can I encourage those who can to plan this weekend and next weekend to go out for dinner and head to Limelight Cinemas in Tuggeranong for a film? You'll never know who you bump into. Even Murrumbidgee's own Minister Davidson had the good taste to take her family out for a night at the movies in Tuggeranong a few weeks ago when I had bumped into her in my Tuggeranong best, that is to say track pants and Ugg boots. In honouring, my commitment, uh, in honouring my commitment to the electorate to be the first member of this Legislative Assembly to open an electorate office, a regular and accessible place for my constituents to meet with me and discuss matters of concern, I've partnered with a local business in Jindabar Cafe on the ground floor of Flax House on Cowlishaw Street. I was proud to support this business with the purchase of daily chai lattes while I was a student at Lake Tuggeranong College, and now as an adult with a slightly different job, Lisa and Daryl know to have the biggest coffee they can possibly pour ready for me every Friday morning. It would be remiss if I did not share the attachment that the Brindabella Greens team has with the Lazari Brothers Cafe on Carlton Street in Canberra. Throughout the election campaign, it was Lazari Brothers that doubled as our base of operations with quality homemade vegan snacks and soy and almond milk coffees fueling the enthusiastic volunteers who worked so hard to give me the privilege to even make this speech. When I bought my first home, Fiona, who owns the markets in Waniassa, gifted me with an awesome new piece of embroidery that I recently shared with my followers on Facebook that reads, Homo, sweet homo. While those on the opposition benches and even some in the government may dispute how sweet I am, and on occasion, uh, I am always committed to doubling down on the homo and my support for small businesses in Tuggeranong. Regular followers of the My Tuggeranong Facebook page have been watching and waiting with bated breath for the grand opening of That Pasta Place Alfredo's at the Lanyon Marketplace. I'm delighted to see that yesterday their grand opening 2.0 was a success, and I can assure them I plan on carb loading with them tomorrow night as a personal reward at the end of a busy sitting week. It speaks to the strong resilience of the ACT economy through a global pandemic that small businesses feel confident to open in Canberra, and as a proud local member, I'm particularly humbled when those small businesses choose to open their doors in Tuggeranong. On Sunday, the 12th of September, the Thawa Preschool will host a 2021 Thawa Bush Fair. I was delighted we were able to secure the future of the Thawa Preschool in the Parliamentary and Governing Agreement. Many local businesses, Mr Assistant Speaker, have thrown their support behind the bush fair, like Territory Tanks and Plumbing, Synergies for Service, Earth Moving Creations and Aquatic Achievers Swim School, just to name a few. I'm incredibly impressed by small businesses who, in these trying times, continue to take their social contracts so seriously and put up their hand to support community initiatives. I encourage Canberrans to engage with and spend their hard-earned money in businesses that have a proven track record of giving back to this local community. So many creative, progressive, entrepreneurial Canberrans have created ways to support small business and stimulate our economy without excess consumerism, which we know has an impact on our planet. In collaboration with the Muralanyan Youth Centre and the YWCA, Sea Change recently hosted a sustainable Southside and upcycling markets. I was pleased to attend these markets last weekend where I picked up some homemade goodies and hearty homemade soup from the Gordon Community Centre. I've come to rely on the good folk of Tuggeranong to help me balance out my otherwise indulgent diet. To end, Mr Assistant Speaker, I'd like to thank our Health Minister and congratulate all Canberrans on yet another Donut Day. Keeping our communities COVID free has meant that we have avoided the worst of the economic outcomes and job losses that others around the country are currently experiencing. But more importantly, we've kept our community safe. The exceptional vaccine take up and rollout in this city is testament to our healthcare workers and health service planning as well as our community's sense of shared responsibility. It is important that we remember that behind these economic issues, there is a significant health crisis unfolding not far from our border, where just today someone in their 20s has lost their battle with COVID-19. Failing to treat the health crisis extremely seriously and quickly leads us to the worst situations like that that are unfolding in New South Wales. This lockdown is necessary to protect the health of people who live in Sydney, and we will always support a health-first approach to this crisis. Managing the impact of Sydney's delayed lockdown on us is involving careful analysis and planning, strong communication and relationships with business, and targeted advocacy to the Commonwealth. The ACT Greens support Minister Chain's amendment, and we encourage Ms Cassley, as a strong small business sp a spokesperson in this place, to consider writing a not dissimilar letter to her federal counterparts. Thank you very much. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Ms Clay. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. 
Thanks. He's slow. <laughs> COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on hospitality and our nighttime economy. But let's not forget the industry that goes hand in hand with the hospitality, and that's the arts sector. The arts sector includes all performers, our dancers, our singers, our DJs, poets, musos. Any place we go for the atmosphere, whether it's a restaurant with a live jazz band, or a pub with a live rock band, or a poetry slam at Smith's, it's made better by the arts. Art makes our hospitality better, and the two are entwined. We need to support them both. I love the arts. I come from a family of musicians, painters, and writers. I understand how important the arts are to our community well-being. I also know exactly how hard it is to make a living, or to make any money at all, from highly skilled and professional arts practice. Many of our artists weren't eligible for federal funding like JobKeeper due to the nature of their gig work. Most artists have a second job to get by, and many of our performers work the bar or front of house at a show. So in addition to losing that live gig work, many of our artists lost their second income at the same time in hospitality. Now I'm pleased to see that the ACT has shown much greater understanding and compassion for our arts sector than the federal government, but life is still hard for many of our practitioners. For instance, not all of our live events have been included in ACT recovery measures. Blasi Dar in Belconnen is one example. Minister Shane and I have both been in touch with Rachel, who runs Blasi Dar. I'm really pleased with the sensible COVID measures that we've taken in Canberra. They're keeping us really safe. And I'm also pleased that some exemptions were made to help out live music. And I was pleased to see Amp It Up as well. But the current COVID exemptions for live music exclude other live performance. Blasi Dar is not classified as a live music venue. They host dancing, which is in fact a lower risk activity for COVID than singing. But this means that they're not eligible for those live music exemptions. They are continuing to operate, but they have to do so with really low audience numbers, currently only 33 people. They've tried to access exemptions, but they haven't been successful. Blasi Dar is home to burlesque, circus, belly dance, pin-up, drag, comedy, cabaret and much more. I've seen some of my friends perform there and it's a great night. They host award-winning artists and community classes and they have a real focus on body positivity. As well as a great local business, they're providing exactly what we need to help boost our spirits through this latest crisis. In a similar vein, I note our long-running policy to establish entertainment precincts. Eleven years ago, the Planning Committee made recommendations about entertainment precincts to support the live music scene. There have been many reports since, including the Government's Entertainment Action Plan 2019. When I asked about this in the last sittings, I was pleased to hear from the Minister for Planning that implementation is underway. Now I understand the need to look at long-term planning over quick fixes, and I understand the delays caused by COVID. But we need to get on with this project if we're going to have live music in future. We need to implement all the actions in the entertainment precinct plan. We need to trial the temporary special entertainment area in the city centre. We need to make sure that festivals like the National Multicultural Festival will not risk closure if those in newly built hotels and apartments lodge noise complaints. In any of the steps we're taking to help our hospitality sector, I urge our government to make sure we help out small business venues follow through on our previous commitments and remember the artists who perform in these small businesses. No one understands the notion of a work in progress better than an artist. So let's adjust our measures where we can in response to community feedback and feedback from our arts sector. Let's keep working on our COVID responses and our assistance measures and make sure we're getting them right. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker, and uh, I thank uh, colleagues for their contribution uh, to the debate today, and uh, particularly Minister Chain for the amendment uh, that she has moved. Uh, undoubtedly had the opportunity over the last 18 months to discuss uh, the range uh, of measures and supports uh, that governments can provide uh, during significant uh, economic shocks. Uh, some have proven to be more effective than others. Uh, and so I, I, I do note, uh, sort of the wry smile in light of uh, some of the debates of last year, that the, uh, the motion 
the original motion before us today is uh, uh, largely endorsing the, uh, the approach that the Territory Government took uh, last year during uh, the lockdowns uh, in the ACT in terms of being able to deliver support. Now, as uh, Minister Chain has uh, identified in her amendment, uh, there are many areas of agreement uh, in terms of the amendment and the original motion in terms of both the nature of support that could be provided uh, and uh, I, the reality that in fact that support is in place. What might be useful uh, in terms of this debate and for the broader understanding of uh, the government's thinking and the sorts of data and metrics that will drive future decision making uh, is uh, to have a bit of a deeper dive into uh, you know, what's occurring in terms of retail trade, uh, turnover for businesses and diving down into particular industry sectors. Because the headline figures are obviously very strong for uh, the ACT, both uh, across the year uh, and in the most recent data. Uh, but as the government has uh, indicated uh, by decisions taken already and acknowledged very publicly, uh, there are some sections of the ACT economy uh, that are doing exceptionally well, in fact achieving all-time record levels uh, of turnover. There are others uh, that are much more exposed uh, to tourism. Uh, that are having amongst the toughest times they've had, certainly uh, since the first wave uh, of the virus. Uh, and so as we uh, look at each industry sector and what is actually occurring and the actual data, that is what's driving uh, the government's decision making. Uh, that's why uh, we have provided support, uh, particularly targeted uh, at accommodation and tourism providers, as I indicated. Question time, 85% uh, you know, of, uh, of the available domestic market uh, has been lost to those businesses. Uh, and obviously the other part of the market uh, that remains is somewhat reluctant uh, to travel at this time in spite of the ACT's uh, relatively long-term COVID-free status. So that necessitated uh, an assistance package. Uh, so I take no news as good news in terms of uh, the opposition's reaction to that. I uh, have not criticised it, so I presume that they are comfortable uh, that the government has taken the appropriate response. We tend to hear, of course, uh, when the opposition is unhappy uh, uh, with measures uh, that we take. Indeed, yes, no, that, that's possibly also true. Opposition agreeing with government is not necessarily um, a front page uh, newspaper story. I, I, I do acknowledge that. I do acknowledge that. Uh, it, it can, yes. Sometimes it will surprise the media that there is a government. Uh, and then it, then it is a story. There's no doubting that. Uh, so I, I, think, I think it will be useful, uh, in addition to Minister Chain's comments, just to, to have a bit of a, a deeper dive at what's happening in, in hospitality, particularly uh, as there's been a lot of discussion today about cafes, restaurants and takeaway food services uh, as bearing the brunt of a difficult period. Uh, and so uh, I think it's best to sort of look at a baseline year that was pre-COVID and that's 2019. Uh, and in that year, uh, the turnover for uh, this sector of industry was $866.5 million. Uh, or $72.2 million a month, or about $2.4 million a day, uh, to give some context. In 2020, uh, during, particularly during the lockdowns of April and May, that monthly turnover of about $70 million uh, fell to $38 million and $47 million in April and May of last year. It recovered as the year went on and reached nearly $75 million again in a month in December of 2020. But the year average uh, was 740, or the, the year total turnover, 746 million, 62.2 million a month. So the impact of that two month lockdown uh, and that, that period that was the worst of the first wave, April and May, uh, took an average of 10 million a month uh, off the turnover of those businesses. Now, as we look to 2021, uh, so far for the six months, uh, 446 million and an average uh, an 
average monthly turnover of 74.4 million. So in fact, more in the first six months of 2021 than the, the base year of 2019. To put it in a daily context, it was 2.4 million a day. In 2014, it dropped to 2 million a day. In 2020, it is now sitting at 2.5 million a day for the first six months uh, of 2021. Now, it's my expectation based upon uh, the, uh, the July data that, that I understand we will get at the end of August that that number uh, will reduce. Uh, I don't think, based on the current settings in the ACT, and now that the month of July has indeed passed, that it will fall from the 77 odd million dollars that was uh, the June original uh, data to 38 million. But clearly, if it did, then that would undoubtedly trigger a very significant government support package, uh, because that would be more than the 30 per cent uh, turnover reduction in that industry sector. So again, I note from the original motion that there, there appears to be agreement on 30 per cent or greater uh, as a threshold. So as we look at uh, this particular sector, uh, that clearly was crossed in terms of a, a reduction in turnover for April and May of last year. But from the vantage point of the data for the first six months, we would need to see that number fall from uh, the mid 70 millions that it's in now. And I note that the May data was the highest ever month in the history of all record keeping. So the most money spent ever in the history of the ACT in restaurants, cafes, takeaways occurred in May of this year. The equal second highest monthly figure ever occurred in March of this year, and the third highest monthly figure occurred in June. So three of the four highest trading months in the history of the ACT for this industry have occurred in the last six months. And what that tells me uh, is that in the absence of the capacity to spend money overseas or interstate as a result uh, of activity, people are spending it locally. Uh, and that is a good sign, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker. And so I have that in mind in the context of decision making uh, for future government support. So I hope that gives people a sense of what will trigger uh, an ACT government decision. What I also need to observe uh, is the shared responsibility as part of national cabinet agreements and what has occurred in terms of shared responsibility between the Commonwealth and the state governments that uh, have uh, COVID disaster zones declared. Now, there are a number of jurisdictions, the ACT, Tasmania, the Northern Territory, uh, South Australia uh, now, uh, who are not in that disaster uh, declaration. Uh, who are experiencing impacts uh, because the big three states uh, have been uh, either locked down or are in extensive lockdowns. And so this is the area that we are focusing on. Uh, it's not just the ACT calling for a more consistent approach. Uh, and this is on the agenda uh, for the Treasurer's meeting this month. I've raised it twice in National Cabinet and the Commonwealth have been moving on this issue. Uh, aviation is a recent example. Just in, the, in, in this week, the Commonwealth have provided an additional support package for aviation, uh, reflecting you know, its role in tourism and the fact that it is significantly impacted uh, by decisions uh, beyond its control. So I am optimistic that we can uh, forge a sensible partnership uh, between the Territory and the Commonwealth. I've spoken to Treasurer Frydenberg on a number of occasions uh, in the last couple of weeks, indicating that you know, we would provide the tourism support package that we would and that we have, uh, but that I would, would need to talk to him further if the Sydney lockdown uh, was prolonged. Uh, that was before the most recent extension, uh, extending the lockdown out to the rest of this month. Mr Assistant Speaker. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker, and I thank Ms Cassley for bringing this motion, and I commend the motion to the Assembly. And uh, I also thank the other members for their contributions to this debate. It is an important one. And I think that there is no one who would uh, like to be anywhere but Canberra during this time. And, and our response to the pandemic, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, good luck, good management, good compliance, 
probably a combination of all three, we, we have done very well. And my hat's off to not only the frontline health staff, but the small local family businesses that have kept this city moving when everything else seemed to stop. And these are the businesses that we're talking about. Now, it's important to note <clears throat> that whilst there's always been talk about, well, hold on, the federal government needs to take responsibility, it's important to note that they have done a lion's share of the heavy lifting with $700 million in JobKeeper payments to the ACT and over $500 million in cash flow boosts to ACT businesses, in addition to the tax income cuts, uh, income tax cuts, as well as, of course, record investment in infrastructure in the ACT. And whilst, of course, this is a global pandemic, and the lion's share of the management and financial support has come from the federal government. Let's not forget that we're talking about businesses that are run by Canberrans, for Canberrans, and these are the people who we, as a legislature, have responsibility for and have a loyalty to. And so, of course, it is also incumbent on the ACT government to step up when it is most required. Now, the figures that the Chief Minister has just spoken about in this debate are very interesting, and it does actually highlight how well the ACT has done. But, but, and this is the big but, when you look at the figures from that perspective in that big picture, sure, on paper, it looks like we don't need any further assistance. It looks like that we're doing really well, actually, in fact, better. And we know that individually, there are businesses that are doing better. We know there are businesses that have actually done better throughout this pandemic. But, Mr. Assistant Speaker, can I make two points? One, whilst there are businesses that have done better, there are so many others that have not. There are others that have not. And that's why Ms. Cassley's motion specifically says support for the businesses that have seen a downturn of 30% or greater. This is not a call for the ACT government to hand out money like lollies. This is about supporting the businesses in a targeted way, the businesses that are suffering and are continuing to suffer. There is no doubt that the ACT does rely on a lot of tourism and especially from the domestic market. And with the lockdowns that we see in the big states, that is what they're missing out on. The second point can I make also is that those figures that the Chief Minister talked about, especially the really good figures in May, that was before this current New South Wales lockdown. So the businesses that are coming to us seeking support are feeling the pain now. And we want to make sure that we support them when they need it most. Now, of course, I think Mr Davis is the one who encouraged Ms Cassidy to write to the Federal Treasurer. Let me assure members in this place that we are in contact with our Federal counterparts. And I have to put on the record my thanks to the ACT Liberal Senator Zed Selja, who has been absolutely doing his part to stick up for ACT businesses. Whilst we know that we don't have a lockdown and we have been fortunate enough not to have a case for over a year, we know that we are impacted by the lockdowns in other states. And that is something that I think the Chief Minister, as well as Senator Seselja, as well as us, as well as us, we're all in agreement that it does impact us and that's something that we will continue to fight for. So I thank Ms Cassidy for bringing this motion. It is an important one. And I thank her for her ongoing and continuous support for and advocacy for our small businesses, because certainly it is something that is required in this city. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Ms Cassley, in closing. Closing? Yes. Mr Assistant Speaker, what we see with this amendment is simply the Labor Greens government passing the buck. The government has acknowledged Canberra's hospi hospitality sector does need assistance, yet its response its solution is to call on the Commonwealth Government to increase its support to our hospitality businesses and workers. 
Our Chief Minister and Treasurer thinks that it's enough for him to sign off on a couple of letters while completely shirking his responsibility for the ACT economy and the welfare of business and workers. Understand the deep dive with all of the facts and figures, but I'd love to know what businesses the government has been out and spoken to personally. You cannot on one hand acknowledge that hospitality businesses and workers have been, and I quote, adversely affected by lockdowns, and then on the other hand say that it's the federal government to offer support. The most we get from the business minister Members. I will consider additional or extended supports as the situation evolves. It's not good enough. Mr Assistant Speaker, how bad does it need to be before the government realises that the some or parts of the sector, after the deep dive, understand it's parts of the sector that needs help? And that's why my motion is calling for 30% of businesses who are struggling. That can prove it. 30% downturn. Thank Mr. you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms Chain, Ms Chain. It's not about a cash splash or a willy-nilly throwing out of funds to businesses that have misused money. They are desperately struggling from the lockdowns that we have most recently seen. The hospitality needs this government to lead with a survival plan which includes the cash grants. I wonder how the government will feel as they walk past hospitality businesses that are closing up in the next month or two. Business is asking for more assistance. Hospitality venues are asking for more support, but the government is turning its back. So I guess those businesses that will end up closing are just collateral damage. Canberra's unemployment rate has climbed. 3.6% in May to 4.9% in June. That means almost 6,000 Canberrans are now out of work. As I said earlier, Mr Assistant Speaker, I fear that the worst is yet to come. What further proof does this government need that our hospitality sector, sections of, are struggling and needs a lifeline from the government elected to support business and workers? I reject the amendment. The question is that Ms Chain's amendment be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the eyes have it. Division required, ring the bells.
Mr. Hansen. All members who can't be present are here. Lock the doors. Members, the question is, the question is that Ms. Chain's amendment to Ms. Cassley's motion be agreed to. <coughs> Clark. Mr. Barr. Yes. Ms. Berry. Mr. Braddock. Yes. Ms. Birch. Yes. Mr. Kane. No. Ms. Cassley. No. Ms. Chain. Yes. Ms. Clay. Yes. Ms. Davidson. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Gentleman. Yes. Mr. Hanson. No. Mrs. Jones. No. Mrs. Kickett? No. Ms. Lauder? Ms. Lee? No. Mr. Milligan? No. Ms. Orr? Yes. Mr. Parton? No. Dr. Patterson? Yes. Mr. Pedersen? Yes. Mr. Rattenbury? Yes. Mr. Steele? Yes. Ms. Stephen Smith? Yes. Ms. Vassarotti? Yes. The result of the division is eyes 15, noes 8. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that Ms. Cassley's motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Private Member's Business Notice Number 2. Mr. Braddock. Oh, sorry. I move the motion in my name on the notice paper relating to community languages. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I rise to seek the support of this Assembly for making Canberra a more inclusive community, one where everyone has equal opportunities to participate in government and community. A Canberra where people of all backgrounds have a voice, celebrate their cultures and contribute in our communities. I am sure I can say with confidence that everyone here has enjoyed the Multicultural Festival. This much-loved Canberran event provides a delight for the senses, whether it be watching the dances and displays, the beautiful music and singing, or perhaps most memorably, for the taste buds as we quaff and eat our way in a culinary journey across the world. But the festival is just the tip of the iceberg that is multiculturalism. Nine-tenths are in fact below the surface the speaking of languages other than English in the home, the dance classes performed after school, the coming together of family and friends for special events, the sharing of recipes and food, that sense of community. Since being elected as the member for Yerribee, the most diverse electorate in the ACT, I've spoken with many community groups and two recurrent themes come through as to where they think the government can and should do better. Firstly, we know there are barriers for people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities to fully participate in our government processes. We need to address these barriers so as to enable these communities to share their insights, experiences and backgrounds to inform better decision making across the ACT, to enable access to grants and government support that help make Canberra a community. Second, 
The focus on multicultural policy is often on sharing culture in a broader community. But as we have been told, you cannot share what you have not kept. Strengthening and supporting connections to culture, language and community is an essential part of maintaining and supporting a diverse Canberra. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is these two issues, civic participation in our democracy and supporting connections to culture that the motion is seeking to address today. So firstly, why civic participation and connection to culture? In identifying what Canberra should aspire to for civic engagement for multicultural communities, I refer to the Settlement Council of Australia. The Council is a national peak body that represents a community of members whose core work is helping, make, is helping people make Australia home. Together with their members, the Settlement Council developed the National Settlement Outcome Standards, which equip settlement service providers to offer the best possible support to newly arrived individuals families and communities who are settling in Australia. The standards themselves apply to whole of government and whole of community. They are the fabric through which we welcome migrants and help them become socially, economically, spiritually and emotionally connected to our communities. My motion calls on the ACT government to commit to the standards so that we know we are adhering to best practices in the sector. A key part of civic participation is ensuring that individuals and communities are assisted to develop their knowledge and understanding of Australia's social and political systems and reinforce knowledge of their rights and responsibilities, as well as supported to share their own stories and opinions to ensure their voices help shape Australia's civic and political landscape. In the words of former Race Discrimination Commissioner Dr Tim Sultpamanasan, multiculturalism is a success story but it is also a success that demands our vigilance. Those who arrive on Australian shores as migrants aren't expected to remain mere guests. Rather, they are expected and encouraged to become fellow citizens of equal standing in society. Australia's multiculturalism is based on a compact of citizenship. This compact requires active outreach and engagement to ensure all communities can participate fully in ACT government processes and policy development. Federal government programs primarily focus on support to attain citizenship, but there are comparatively few programs and supports for exercising the full rights of citizenship. Increasing civic participation includes increasing the knowledge of the civic engagement processes, practical programs encouraging engagement with the Legislative Assembly, translating government consultation documents, ensuring community groups have adequate capabilities to effectively advocate for their own needs, and improving migrant and refugee representation in the government, parliament, media, and other public spheres. Gaps in this area flow through to engagement and participation in a range of democratic processes. For example, for the last four years, only one multicultural group has made a budget submission to the ACT government's budget consultation process with many others missing the opportunity to advocate for resources and programs that would allow them to meet the needs of their communities. This is a strong sign that groups are not being adequately supported, communicated with or mentored to be able to effectively have their voices heard. And so I am calling on the government to, to commit to increasing civic participation through targeted support so that we can see these voices come through loud and clear. Multicultural voices are also missing from government grant applications. <coughs> I've heard from many groups that they struggle to write grants or they are not successful when they do. Because of their complexity and other requirements, government funding processes are frequently inaccessible to many multicultural communities. I would like to note as an exception to this, which was the recent community connection grants with a low barrier for entry for a small amount of funds we saw a significant increase in a number of successful multicultural groups. This is to be applauded and hopefully continued. Because not having access to these government resources impacts the ability of multicultural groups to support advocacy, outreach and cultural connection. In particular, the groups with the greatest need are often the newest and the least aware of how the government can support them. For this reason, we are calling on the government to commit to increasing the accessibility of grants to multicultural community groups 
through increasing the ability of peak bodies to auspice more grants with minimal barriers to entry for new, newly established groups. Also running sector-specific information and training sessions for grant applications. We look forward to hearing at the end of the reporting period how these initiatives have enhanced participation in democratic and grants processes. Now I'd like to talk about supporting connections to culture. Canberra is uniquely positioned in Australia. Given the size of our population, we have a surplus of riches and opportunities in this space. Firstly, we are home to nearly 80 embassies and high commissions. We are also home to the federal government, where many roles require an understanding of other cultures and languages in order to be able to do their job. This means we are blessed with many multicultural communities with a strong identity, mixed with a population that recognises and celebrates the diversity in cultures and languages. This is a unique and valuable resource for Canberra and Australia. The seven-year-old learning Mandarin in a community languages class today may in 20 years' time be serving as a diplomat in Beijing. The children raised in a home environment that speaks Swahili may in the future help establish business links between Australia and Africa. An understanding of different religions helps Australian and ACT governments to develop and implement tailored and nuanced policies. The best practice guidelines call for newly arrived individuals and communities to be supported to preserve their cultural identity and values. Again, I'll say, you can't share what you don't keep. <coughs> you don't maintain your culture, you have nothing to share. Our multiculturalism will crumble within the matter of a few short generations if communities are not able to maintain their traditions and languages. The importance of mother tongues was noted and agreed to by this assembly in a tripartisan motion introduced by Mr Alistair Coe in 2017. Many colleagues still present may remember that motion, and in particular how Mrs Kickett and Ms Lee spoke to it in Tongan and Korean, respectively. There are around 170 languages spoken across Canberra. We are so lucky to have over 50 community language schools operating here. These schools help people connect with their cultural backgrounds, promote understanding and mutual respect among ethnic communities, and teach languages, history and culture to their students. While it is great to see more students utilising our community language schools, it is important that funding continues to keep up with demand. This is one practical way that the government can actively support connection to culture here in the ACT. I'm calling on the government to review the school's funding. The funding that supports students has not been updated in a decade. The ACT invests $90 per student into these schools, while by way of comparison, Victoria invests $170 per student. So my question is, how much value do we place on this language training in our community? Any review of funding also needs to consider the long-term, sustainable and adequate resourcing of the sector and this may be through in-kind services or direct funding. Because another challenge that is a perennial for my electorate is access to community spaces. The ACT Community Languages Association, the Umbrella Group, currently rents ACT government properties to hold classes while relying on some block and per head funding to carry on the operations of the association and members' schools. The issue of insufficient funds and uncertain tenure over classrooms is causing great distress to this essential community service. Twelve language schools are facing closure because the government schools that host them do not wish to renew the contract. Nine of them are in my home turf of Gungalan. Just when you thought I was going to go through another speech without mentioning that G word. As the president of the ACT Language Schools Associations, Dr Fuxin Lee stated, we need stability and certainty of a place to belong. For this reason, a motion calls on the ACT government to ensure the status and stability of Canberra's community languages schools by securing long-term affordable access to suitable venues in which to hold their after-hours classes. And finally, but not least, community, organi community organisations have also requested greater support for recognised professional development for their volunteers, not only to improve the quality of training <laughs> and teaching that they deliver to their community, 
but to reward those volunteers with a transferable skill and qualification. We commend this call to the government. Thus, in closing, for those communities to maintain their identity, their culture and language. It is not something that can be done by only one day at the Multicultural Festival. It takes a continuous investment of time, energy and resources over the course of a year. Community leaders and volunteers who, in, in addition to the challenges of living their daily lives in a foreign culture, culture freely and with great charity, invest large quantities of time and energy to the members of their community. I'm calling on the government to provide the enablers to help them retain their languages and their cultural heritage, and that these groups be included and supported to actively engage in ACT government decision-making and democratic processes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Braddock. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs Jones. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, I thank Mr Braddock for bringing this motion for discussion today. It very cre clearly raises the need for an update to the support that community language schools are given by the government and to modernise the government's approach to bring us more in line with neighbouring states. Um, Mr Braddock mentioned the social contract and it goes to the very heart of government that we are able to facilitate the outcomes that we want to see in the community. At the outset, let me say that this issue raised includes the settling process of new Australians into our city and the continuation of culture of the country of origin in people as they settle into being Australian. The navigation of government services and the needs that new Australians will have to access the breadth of services that are available for their proper functioning as Australians and Canberrans, especially if they have needs which government can assist with. There is another issue which I raise in this debate, and it goes to the heart of that access to government services, as well as friendship with those of us who have been in this nation for generations now, as, uh, as in the ability to integrate fully as Australians and become familiar with the Australian way of life. Becoming Australian is a process that I've often heard expressed as taking a generation, which is something I've often thought we should work on because while identity is a very personal and multifaceted matter, it is something we can always uh, learn how to better assist people with. We, we do want our new Australians to take great steps forward and we do want uh, to be a city that is on the front foot with this process. To go back a few years, I, firstly, I can say that I was one of those children who went to Saturdays to a community language school, and Mr and Mrs Ottavi ran the Italian school in North Hobart in a building called the Italian Cultural Centre, which was a very ancient house next door to the Italian club. We learned language and dance. I have photos of me performing, which have been circulated uh, to members outside of the, of the debate, <laughs> which <laughs> where I learned... Um, of me um, dancing at the Italian club in my Tarantella cultural uniform. I had to dance with my older brother, which is annoying, but nonetheless, I was learning the movements and the patterns and rhythms and sounds of my mother's Italian culture. The older generation would praise us for learning it and performing, and when I felt that I was a bit different to the mainstream Aussie kids at school, I had a tribe and a team behind me saying that I was worthwhile and that my mixed cultural background was something to learn about and to celebrate. Go back a few years earlier, long before I was born, and my grandfather arrived in Tasmania alone without his wife, my grandmother, Nonna Nicolina, and my mother, who was then two years old, when he left for Australia. The plan was that after he'd been in Australia for about a year, he would have established a home for his family and they could then come, and they would be reunited. Grandfather was boarding in a house with some other Italians doing shift work, and he sent the papers for Nonna and Mum to come out, and he didn't hear back. There was no Facebook, no Skype. There probably wasn't even a phone in his home village in Italy. And he waited and waited, and every day he would go to the letterbox and sit there and wait for the agreement to arrive that Nonna was going to come. This went on for months. And the postman began to ask him why he was always waiting. And he explained in his broken English that he was waiting for a reply that his wife was coming. The postman told him to go to the State Parliament down in Salamanca Place in Hobart and to ask to speak to his local member. But he just couldn't picture how he was going to be allowed to turn up to a place like that without an invitation or a formal appointment. No one he knew knew how to make an appointment like that. So he kept waiting at the letterbox day after day, getting steadily more and more depressed. 
Eventually, after keeping on at him for weeks and weeks to go to the Parliament, the postman got really angry at him and told him in no uncertain terms he had to go to the Parliament. He didn't know where it was, but he decided to put on his best Sunday clothes and walked into the city and asked around until he found the Parliament. He went to the front door very scared because he expected that he would meet a policeman at the front door and he would be kicked out. These were his cultural expectations from his homeland. However, when he approached the door, he was met by an usher who showed him to a waiting room. He waited there and was eventually taken to see his local MP, who wrote to the then Minister for Immigration, Harold Holt, who confirmed that the papers he had filled out for his wife to come had been lost as part of a shipment that went lost missing overseas. His local member was then able to help him arrange new papers and shortly after, at three years since he'd left his wife and daughter, Nonna and Nonna were reunited and my five-year-old mother, Giovanna, arrived in Australia. That ordeal had lasting effects on Grandpa and it was a shame that in the process of getting here and becoming Australia, he had encountered such trouble. Grandma must have really worried if he was ever going to send for her. It must have been a very difficult time all round. The assumptions of how governments and public servants and parliaments and police behave can be so incredibly different and are formed by our new Australians' experiences of their countries of origin. Therefore, the work we do here to promote understanding of how the Assembly and ACT government work, um, that there is support and that there are grants and government helps available, as Mr Braddock has mentioned, to people to assist them in settling here and maintaining um, their original cultures as well as their Australian new culture is vital to proper settlement for people into this their new home. So I genuinely support this motion and the intent to achieve this. Regarding the community <coughs> language schools here, that is also an important element of this motion. It seems yet again the government is not quite paying attention to the details of the policies set under the Stanhope era, which have not seemingly been refreshed or reassessed. The funding per head with community language schools receives has been at a standstill for about 10 years, I'm told. In Melbourne, students learning parents' mother tongue in a community language school are funded by the state government $245 per head, and from this funding comes the cost of both delivery as well as the rent of premises. In New South Wales, the funding is $131 per head, plus free access to government school buildings, making this assistance at least equally as valuable as the funding in Victoria. Here in the ACT, the funding is a remarkable point of $90 per head and no free access to school buildings. In fact, groups here pay for the use of classrooms on the weekends and after hours. The Community Language Schools Association, under the able leadership of Mr Fuxin Lee, has 48 member community language schools and two member play schools. In Gungahlin alone, there are 12 member schools, and the arrangement for six of those schools in Palmerston Primary School is not being renewed next year, and I appeal to Minister Berry to assist via the Education Directorate to find them another local option if needed, and if they cannot continue at Palmerston for whatever reason. Currently, the community language schools, particularly in Gungahlin, are under pressure, unable to have confidence that they will be able to access school buildings within their local region. It's very disappointing, to say the least. It was interesting to hear the Chief Minister speak yesterday about the new facility being built at EPIC for the multicultural community and that it may have the chance for language classrooms in the building. It may not be the best location, however, it would be good to see what comes out of that. However, that building is at least a couple of years away. So from my own time living overseas and learning a new language in country, as well as from my mother and my grandparents' experiences, I know precisely the impact of not being fluent in the language of the country in which you live. And from my many years of door knocking, especially in Gungahlin, I can tell you there are many women with children who do not yet have proficiency in English. This is caused by the family's need to prioritise financial stability above language skills and the prevalence of at-home mothers amongst new arrivals. I studied this issue in depth in my first term here. In the first four years, I was shadow for multicultural affairs. The states and territories, along with the Commonwealth Government, share the responsibility to get new Australians every opportunity to learn and become fluent in English to be able to experience all the benefits and responsibilities of being Australian. Newly arrived people need to be able to speak English as much as they possibly can, and there are various barriers to this. 
The study I commissioned in 2013 in my office shows that the family's financial stability takes, of course, precedence over everything when people first arrive here, and very often that means that mums are at homes with kids while dads are at work. That is how it usually works when there is a choice to be made amongst traditional people. As a result, men are accessing English conversation practice daily in the workplace, however women are not. The answer to this barrier is conversation classes in the home one-on-one, -on -one, which until the pandemic were offered in Canberra, and the other option is classes in a community facility such as a library with auxiliary childcare. This is not the setting up of a full childcare arrangement, but leaves mum as the on-site primary care of the children, or indeed dads where that's the case, and have a babysitter, a part-time childcare, auxiliary childcare in the room next door so that parents can learn English and not be out of pocket for the necessary supervision of their children. Affordable or even better free childcare, or indeed the provision of English language conversation classes in the home can go a long way to resolving this tension. So that's why I've circulated the amendment to the motion, which I believe has broad support here. Um, while agreeing to Mr Braddock's motion, it adds to the opportunity for the government to take a fresh look at what English classes are being provided now, how they're being taken up, uh, given the pandemic is unlikely to end any time soon, there is a need to ensure that these language skills development opportunities are continuing. So, Mrs Jones, are you moving the amendment? I move my amendment. So, so I'll need you to seek leave to move... I'll seek leave to move my amendment. I'll need you to seek leave to move the three amendments together. Uh, yes. So I seek leave to move the three amendments together. Is leave granted? Um, so the question is that Mrs Jones's amendments to Mr Braddock's motion be agreed to. Ms Jane. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm very pleased to speak to the motion and uh, to the amendment as circulated today. Mr Braddock's motion speaks to the indispensable contribution of the multicultural community to our city and the ACT government could not agree more with its sentiment. I particularly want to speak to the references in the motion to language and the integral role of language in cultural sharing and retention. We proudly recognise and celebrate the linguistic diversity of our multicultural communities here in the ACT. Over 170 different languages are spoken in the ACT, with the 2016 census showing 23.8% of ACT households spoke a language other than English. That is an increase from 2011, when it was 21.1% of households. And of course, we look forward to the results from the upcoming census. There are over 12,000 Mandarin speakers, over 4,000 Vietnamese speakers, and around 3,500 speakers of Hindi and of Spanish in the ACT. Linguistic diversity is also a key pillar of multiculturalism, and it plays a crucial role in the development of personal, social and cultural identity, which I think Mrs Jones highlighted particularly well. A strong foundation and familiarity in a child's mother tongue allows for a deeper understanding of themselves and their community and an increased sense of well-being and of confidence. I'm pleased that the ACT government has been working closely with the ACT Community Language Schools Association and since 2012, the government has provided annual funding grants to over 40 ACT Community Language Schools. As others have noted, the current ACT government investment in community languages schools is over $275,000 annually. The grant program provides a per student grant to all eligible schools and provides supplementary funding to play groups and small operations to assist with running costs. Under the second action plan of the ACT multicultural framework, 2015 to 2020, the ACT government committed to undertake an independent review of the investment in community language schools in the ACT. The purpose of the review was to ensure that the ACT government continues to meet the needs of the Canberra community and that future investment delivers positive and effective outcomes. And I can confirm for Mrs Jones that we did look across jurisdictions in that review. The review considered the role community languages schools play in maintaining and promoting language use in the Canberra community, how they operate, and the standards that guide the delivery of languages services in these schools. 
The review was carried out externally and independently, and it was provided to government recently. Because this review necessarily touches on government venues which provide the teaching and learning spaces, including schools, multiple ministers and directorates are working together on a cross-portfolio response. We have made good progress on this, and it has been our intention to publicly table the review and its recommendations and the response at the completion of the work required. We are on track to do this by end October, so we are happy to agree what the motion calls for, including considering in our response the sub-dot points that Mr Braddock has included at 3A. Regarding Mrs Jones' comments, including about specific schools, the ACT government does support the community use of public school facilities, and, but this does need to be where it complements school operations. I think Mrs Jones would agree that we need to ensure the needs of the important work of community languages schools and the needs of primary schools are complementary. I understand that the issues that have been raised by the school in, pre in question, uh, which has an agreement with the community language school in, in relation to how the room is returned at the end of community language lessons, noting that teachers go to a lot of effort to set up and plan their classrooms and lessons, and interruptions to this can be counterproductive. I can confirm that Minister Berry and I are working hand in hand to resolve the current issues and, of course, in response to the wider review. I also note the other issues and areas to which Mr Braddock calls on the government to investigate and explore, and we are happy to undertake this work, a good deal of which is an extension or a continuation of what we are already doing. As members may be aware, the Office of Multicultural Affairs works hand in hand with other directorates and multicultural community services, such as the Multicultural Hub and MARS, to deliver positive outcomes for our linguistically diverse and multicultural Canberrans, such as the outcome standards identified by the Settlement Council of Australia. We continue also to improve the design and accessibility of multicultural grants and a range of government programs to make it easier for the community to engage but we can always do more. For the benefit of members, some recent initiatives include the simplification of the 2022 National Multicultural Festival grants and the delivery of two sector-specific workshops to support organisations with their applications. And for those who submitted grant applications for the 2021 festival, which sadly has not been able to go ahead, we have ensured that they have access to those applications so that they do not have to duplicate that effort. In other portfolio areas where I'm directly responsible, we've been working to make grants there simpler, clearer and more accessible generally. And the recently announced ACT Events Fund is an example of this. But I note Mr Braddock's points and we will continue to work on this and we will report back. We've also been actively translating resources and working with other directorates to encourage this too. This was touched on during question time today notably with the Health Directorate with materials about the pandemic, and more recently with Choose CBR, which very pleasingly had a very big take up from multicultural businesses, something that the opposition had called for. I also acknowledge Mrs Jones' amendment and thank her for negotiating with me and Mr Braddock on it. This is something that as a government, we are also happy to investigate. I acknowledge the amendment extends the report back time, uh, and I thank uh, the other members um, for agreeing to this um, two-month extra extension. While we are pleased and, um, uh, to undertake the important work that this motion calls for, I do want to acknowledge that the Office of Multicultural Affairs is a very small team with a very big agenda over the coming months especially. And so um, this small extension does give us just that bit more of the required time to do this work. And I want to put on the record uh, on behalf of the ACT government and particularly myself, uh, my personal thanks to the office for all of their hard work and thorough engagement with the issues in the past and presently and undoubtedly into the future. I and the broader government are committed to supporting the multicultural community and to ensuring that the ACT remains inclusive and welcoming. Look forward to reporting back to the Assembly on the progress of these actions and support the motion and the amendment. Thank you, Minister Chain. Uh, the question is that Mrs Jones' amendments to Mr Braddock's motion be agreed to. Uh, are you closing, Mr Braddock? No? Uh, 
Yep, you can do both. All right. Mr. Braddock. I would like to thank all parties here for your support for this motion, and I think it reflects the critical importance and contribution this community makes to Canberra. Like Minister Chain, I would also like to pass on my appreciation to the members of the Multicultural Affairs Office who work diligently at making now Canberra the community that it is today. In closing, I'd like to say I will fully support the amendment moved by Mrs Jones in the here. The importance of people to be able to learn English as part of engaging with the government is critical, and also the provision of care for them, of care for their children, allows them to concentrate at the task at hand. I am also fully happy to support the amendment to the reporting date, because I'd prefer to see the job done properly rather than the mindless achievement of a specific date. In closing, I'd like to say thank you to all of the multicultural community and the contribution that you make to Canberra now and in the future. And I hope this motion goes some small way in recognising our appreciation of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Braddock. The question is that Mrs Jones's amendment to Mr Braddock's motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I declare that the ayes have it. So the question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Declare that the ayes have it. Sorry? Oh, really? Mr Gentleman. Deputy Speaker, I move the Assembly do now adjourn. Question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Mrs Jones. I thank you very much. On Thursday the 29th of August, I visited a special place in the middle of our city called Leo's Place. A few years ago, palliative care ACT began to question what more it could do to help people with a life-limiting illness. Research revealed that despite 70% of people preferring to die at home in Australia, the number of those who do is below 12%. Dying in Australia is more institutionalised than in most countries. With Australians dying at home at half the rate people do in New Zealand, the US, Ireland and France, care fatigue and the lack of community support, such as respite, is a key reason for this outcome. After investing in a scoping study and developing a model of care, Palliative Care ACT began fundraising to establish a respite option it couldn't find anywhere else in the world. Leo's Place is a non-clinical home away from home where people with a life-limiting illness can come for a few hours or a few days up to a week to give their carers some time to recoup. The original goal was to build purpose-built accommodation to ensure the building met a wide range of needs and provide people with their own space, while offering spaces for people to come together. Of course, a new build would take significant investment and the model was unproven, but palliative care ACT were regularly meeting people who needed this type of support. So rather than wait to build the perfect place, it was decided to test the model on a rental property. Late last year, after searching for the right place, a lease was signed on the home they have just set up, and it is lovely. It feels like a home. The first client arrived in late January, and you can see the effort that has been put into making the place feel so welcoming. Support workers are there to assist when needed, and those staying overnight have had their own room. There is also multiple living spaces for people to relax in while doing a puzzle, reading a book, or watching TV. This sort of innovative care is a wonderful opportunity for our city to show how compassionate a community we can be. Palliative Care ACT has received operational funding from the ACT Government for the proof of concept and has teamed up with the University of New South Wales to assess the benefits. It would be good to do more to help this project to succeed as well. We all need to share the story of this project and help get the news about it around to the people who could benefit. Then at the end of the current funding, we need to continue to support it. 18 months for such a new and valuable initiative may not give it the time to reach its full potential. This is something our entire community should get behind, business, government and individuals. We might need this high quality support ourselves someday. And I thank the staff at Leo's Place for showing me around and the um, lady who was staying there who explained to me what a benefit the place is to her and I thank very much the kind and generous donors who have assisted to get the place going. I uh, look forward to seeing a purpose-built facility built in the ACT because, um, let's say, dying can take a long time. And I have watched many people support their loved ones through that process. 
And sometimes we all need a holiday or a break, no matter what our health and no matter our situation. Thanks very much, Palliative Care ACT, and thanks very much everyone involved in Leo's place. Thank you, Mrs Jones. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn, uh, adjourn at least. Uh, Ms Vassarotti. Thank you, Mr Deputy speaking, Speaker. It's probably appropriate that I rise this afternoon to recognise the passing of two individuals that have made contributions to our local community in very different ways. I would firstly like to acknowledge Derek Wrigley, OAM, who passed away at 97 in late June. Others have written some lovely, some lovely obituaries for Derek and si since then, and since I have limited time in this adjournment speech, I'll keep my remarks very brief. Derek is widely known in Canberra for his design work. As a university architect at the ANU, Derek's designs can be seen everywhere, such as the wooden chairs in some of the older ANU buildings. I recently learned that the beautifully comfortable seats and desks in the Shine Dome were also designed by Derek. He also worked on designing technical aids for people with disabilities, but moved into sustainable housing in the latter part of his career. Derek truly was a designer focused on the needs and the aspirations of people. In the past 20 years or so, Derek became alarmed about climate change and wrote several books on sustainable housing. Derek was a highly valued member of the Australian and New Zealand Solar Energy Society for many years. He made the challenging and creative process of retrofitting houses for improved comfort his forte. Derek routinely held open days in his home in Mawson to showcase to people what they could do in their homes for their, to their homes themselves. His ideas were grounded in pragmatism, function and affordability. And his energy and enthusiasm was infectious. Perhaps his most renowned idea was the Southern Reflector, polished steel mirror, mirrors placed on the southern side of a house to reflect winter sun into the southern rooms. On touring his Mawson home, it was possible to lose your bearings because the sun was beaming in from several directions. Derek would proudly proclaim to visitors how cheerful it made the house. And I think that sums up his attitude to improving homes for everyone. I would also like to recognise the passing of Father Brian Ma, OAM. Ordained in 1966, he was a much loved priest serving in several parishes of, Can of the Canberra and Goulburn Archdiocese, including Braddon for eight years, Bungendore for six years, and Aranda for 15 years. He retired in, retired in 2007 and also passed away at the end of June. As well as these contributions, Father Brian became known for his significant contribution in documenting the history of the Archdiocese. Over the years, as part of his research, he collected a number of records including letters, maps, newspaper cuttings and photographs, which assisted his writing. He wrote a number of articles and papers and the histories of 10 parishes and wrote two books. Father Brian was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for services to the Canberra region through historical organisations and the Catholic Church of Australia in 2009 and was appointed an Archdiocesan historian in 2011. It was in great, with great pleasure that I attended the launch of the Brian Maher Digital Collection in April as part of the Heritage Festival. We certainly needed no reminding just how popular family history of research has become and the work of the Canberra's Heraldry and Genealogy Society in digitising Father Brian's extensive records will make the search for many of the district's older Catholic families so much easier. And as I think I've reported before to this assembly, including my own, Father Brian Ma, Ma was a relative and, I was all, and was always known to me as a family historian. So Vale, Derek Wrigley and Brian Ma, thank you for your very different, con different but important contributions to our community, to our history and to our future. Thank you, Ms Vassarotti. The question is that the assembly do now adjourn. Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, recently I came across a page on the Have Your Say government portal on the topic of the dangerous pavers at Charmwood shops. This is something I have brought to the attention of the Minister several times and he has even appeared on television about it. 
The Minister is well aware that this is an issue local residents care about. So naturally, this consultation page on the Have Your Say portal left me baffled. How hard can it be to fix a pavement? A consultation how to fix paving will just prolong the current untenable situation. And I'd encourage anyone to go to Charnwood Shops, see all of the white lines drawn across most of the entry area to realise that it's a bit of a farce. I understand that there does need to be a longer term solution in place, but the government should just prick, uh, uh, fix broken and dangerous paving. I'm highly supportive of consultation on big picture long term issues that have a major effect on the community, but consultation on fixing broken paving seems a bit over the top. Charnwood locals deserve more than bureaucratic inertia. I have no doubt they'd rather just see the pav pavement fixed than go through endless rounds of so-called community consultation. <clears throat> and Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll emphasise again, I am all for community consultation, but you don't need to consult on, brick on fixing broken paving. It is an effective and comprehensive way that is a broader community <laughs> consultation to make sure services meet the mark. The Labor Greens government probably should have directed their consultation activities towards, for example, their proposed closure of the green waste facility in West Belconnen. If they're going to consult on fixing broken paving, why not consult on something like that? It was only after a, an e-petition that I sponsored reached 2,000 signatures that the government changed the decision to end the lease at the end of June. The pavement at the Charnwood shops, on the other hand, just needs fixing. <coughs> so the, government, the Labor Greens government is doing an online survey and two pop-up sessions at the shops this month. <coughs> to get to this point, it has, it has taken several letters from me on behalf of constituents, a win news story, two government ministers visiting the shops and no doubt many locals writing directly to the minister. And all this, while all this has been happening over many months, in fact, from earlier this year, I think the, uh, the white lines were, were drawn to show how dangerous the Charmwood entry was, it's still not fixed. So the online survey is due to close on 3 September, which is still a month off. The local council role of the ACD government is to keep our pavements even, the roads free from potholes and collect the rubbish. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't believe they're doing these services satisfactorily. Some say this is Canberra's worst government. I call on the Minister, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to fix these pavings now and then to look at longer term solutions for landscaping. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kane. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. Declare that the ayes have it. The Assembly stands adjourned until 10am tomorrow.